We are in New York now, and we have the good fortune of interviewing Father Malachi Martin. And perhaps we could begin by your telling us a bit about yourself, your background, and some of the activities that you are uh, currently engaged in. Well, Bernard, I think I'm going to bore you, but perhaps somebody listening to this tape doesn't know much about me, so I suppose we should cover the essentials. I was born in Ireland in Kerry 70 years ago, and um, 70 years ago, don't forget the 70, 70, and uh, then I was educated in Ireland, and I joined the Jesuits in Ireland just before the war began. And then after the war, having done my philosophy, studied philosophy for three years, and taught uh, uh, little children for another three, they sent me to Belgium for my studies, and I remained there until 1958. And then I had been down to Rome in between years, and if I was finished in Louvain, they posted me to Rome to the Biblical Institute, the Pontifical Biblical Institute. That's an institute in the Vatican which trains professors of scripture. It's fallen on evil days as regards doctrine, uh, they tell me, and I think so. But in, that day, in those days, it was pretty good. And then the Vatican Council started, and I, I, I had gone to my superiors, in 1957 and said, look, I don't think I'm in the right place in life. I think God wants me elsewhere, but there was a lot of work to be done. And uh, then I, I got into harness with a, 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 a cardinal in Rome, Cardinal Augustine Baer, a German cardinal, who was a great friend of the Pope. And um, I decided I worked on with him, and besides teaching at the Biblical Institute, and I, I used to, I wrote, wrote books and published articles in my field, which was paleography, which means ancient handwriting. I specialized in handwriting at the time of Abraham, which is about 1700 BC. And then um, in 1964, then with the permission of the then Pope, Paul VI, I left and um, I came o over to, uh, to America in 1965 and I've remained here ever since. I lived in New York for the simple reason that the first city I s came to, the boat landed here, the U.S., the United States steamship, which I always joke was not a, a boat at all. It was a, a eating house with sleeping rooms attached, run by a crowd of land lovers. But it was a pleasant trip to travel on. And um, I remained here ever since, and I've been engaged in um, doing TV and radio and writing books. I still I say mass every morning, I'm a priest, and say my breviary, and uh, try to keep the decalogue and do the usual things. Um, and that's about the sum total of it all. I've published 15 books, and I'm preparing a 16th, and, um, and there are a lot of articles. You know, the usual run of articles one has to publish in The Remnant and elsewhere. That's about my life story. It's very uneventful, but it's, it's, it's my life. I have a family still living in Ireland, brothers and sisters, and uh, there are certain parts of Ireland, if you go there and throw a stone in any direction, you're going to hit a friend of uh, a relative of mine, a blood relative of mine. We're a very numerous clan in southwest Kerry. And so now then we'll uh, proceed with uh, the interviews, and we're going to be discussing the topic of Satan and his influence in the world today, and also in the church. But before, before we launch into that, I think uh, perhaps you should give our listeners uh, some background or some refresher on just who Satan is and what the origin is of the struggle between good and evil in the world. Yes, but I, I feel a little competent, a little more competent than usual to talk about this because from about my third year in New York, I got uh, engaged in exorcism. Uh, and that was by sheer accident. One night I was rung up by a priest who was in the middle of an exorcism, and his assistant collapsed. So he asked me to put on my clothes and come. It was two o'clock in the morning, and I come over to the uh, to the Bronx and help him out, which I did. And then that started an association. So I've been in that field for quite a while, and um, the uh, I got very interested in the subject of Satanism and uh, and as they call him in America, Old Scrat himself, because we always call him that in America. And um, so I feel a little competent talking about it. The, the amazing thing about our friend, or our enemy, as he really is, is that most people are possess in possession of half lies about him and half truth. There's very little truth known about the devil. We do know from the church and from scripture uh, that Satan uh, was an archangel, that he was one of the brightest and most intelligent of the archangels. We do know that he uh, influenced, at the dawn of creation, before man was created, he did influence a whole horde of other angels, telling them that they would be like unto God, that they would have his power. But uh, there's the half lie. The half lie of that consists of this. Satan never knew God. He never saw God. If he had seen God, he, he could never have fallen. He'd be an angel in heaven. 
So he never knew God, no more than Adam saw God. Adam knew, worked, talked to God, and walked with him, as the scripture says, through a medium of some kind or other. But he didn't see God. Therefore, the, the devil knows far less about God than we think. In fact, you know, several of the fathers of the church have speculated that hell consists of a huge doubt in Satan's mind. Is he really there? What's he like? Is he really, is he really eternal? Will he end too? Is the problem? He doesn't know because he's being tortured by doubt for the rest of his existence. And you know, if you study the notes left behind by suicides and examine their history, the worst form of suicide is the one who doubts. He doesn't know at all. He's doubtful about his own self, he's doubtful about humanity, doubtful about the other side. It's this, it's diabolic. And this is the curse of Satan. He will never know. Number one. Uh, now, he did though rebel. And apparently there was, as the scripture puts it, a great battle between the good angels, led by Michael the archangel, against Lucifer, the light bearer. Apparently he was called the son of the dawn. Uh, he was so brightly intelligent. Probably more intelligent than Michael, but not as faithful. And you know, fidelity and faithfulness often win out over intelligence, as we've seen in our own history. So he was defeated. And Jesus who normally was very, very descriptive and gentle-minded, he had to make reference once to Satan, Satan's fall, to Lucifer's fall from heaven when he was defeated. And he said, he said, you've seen the lightning go from the east to the west in one zigzag flash. It takes less than a hundredth of a second. Well, he said, he fell faster than that. And the, the, the utter, not cruelty, but harshness. I mean, there was no streak of mercy. There was no... No, he made no bones about it. This angel was punished with supreme punishment. He was condemned to what we call hell. And hell, we do know about hell one thing for sure, which you must hold, if you're going to be a faithful Catholic, that there's fire there. Now, fire can be of various kinds, and fire in scripture can be also spiritual, but that he is tortured there forever with his angels, yes. But God, God in view of the world he was going to create, gave Satan a certain series of powers. And those powers are that he, he would test man. Christians have always wondered and the church has always speculated about why God did this because why should God give him a leg at all? As far as we know, God does love purity. He does love um, mercy. He does love compassion. He loves beauty. But look at the beautiful things he's created in nature, the animals and the babies and flowers and trees, and lakes, mountains, oceans, sky, all the beauties we see around us, ourselves, our own beings. Look at me. My body has been going for 70 years. Only God could create it. It has its own particular beauty in that sense. It's not very beautiful, as you see, and not like, like a little wrinkled nut, but the machine is still going. Now, um, but... God preferring all those things, he has one great preference, repentance. He loves to exercise mercy. We have to take this as a given, Bernard. This is a thing of God. So how could he do that unless people were tempted and he had to forgive them? He didn't want a perfect world. He wanted to have a world in which he could exercise mercy. And you know, there's this marvelous psalm, which has about 127 times, for his mercy is above all his works. And this is what Jesus wanted. And that's why it's so mistaken of people who sin, as we all do, because they're caught by something, either the concupiscence of the flesh, or the concupiscence of the eyes, or the pride of life, or whatever, and they feel they've gone so far that they can't get back. That's the very situation that God envisaged. He wants you to come. He wants to forgive. Until you die, there's that marvelous possibility of being received like the prodigal son. Anyway, so he gave Satan the power of tempting man. Uh, but we, just a word about that. We must remember this angel has extremely limited intelligence. He doesn't know what you know by faith, Winston. He doesn't know it. He doesn't know anything about the angelic life. He doesn't know about the Blessed Sacrament. He knows it's, it's the nameless one, and Satan is called the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, he doesn't know the future. He can't predict the future, except I, for instance, can predict the future. If I look at the clouds and say, yeah, the rain clouds are going to come. He has a greater perception of natural things because he's an angel. He can predict in that sense. But he doesn't know what's going to happen in 1996 or 2004. He's extremely limited. But he is the cleverest liar going because he deals with half-truths. Half-truths. And uh, most of the information you find people trotting out about uh, Lucifer today is the half-lie. He's broadcast about himself.
and uh, that's so uh, pernicious because that ruins our possibility of knowing. Now, uh, uh, Lucifer, we know too from the church, was given a certain amount of liberty in the beginning until Christ came. And once Christ died on the cross, he was bound in chains. And the church was given a thousand years, it was said, in which to flourish. We got that thousand years. And according to all, what, all, all, all of the fathers, what they teach, and, and the revelations which the Church has declared as authentic, that thousand years expired about the 1700s or 1800s. And we now are in a moment when Satan was loosed, and again the voice of revelation and the voice of tradition and the voice of the teachers and the Church and the saints and the popes comes in and say, but his loosing was only for 100 years and that, that freedom of his is coming to an end in our day in the 1990s. So we have been subject, therefore, to uh, Lucifer's, uh, Lucifer's raging freedom to recoup what we lost. Because remember, in that thousand years between, say, the year 400 and the year 1400, Christianity spread. Whole peoples were converted. Whole of Europe was. And when they got to Mexico, they converted 8 million in two years. Remember, they, they, it was astounding. And Christianity did spread. And even today, Christianity is the biggest religion going. And the Catholic Church is 18% of the human race. It's almost 1 billion. So uh, he lost an awful lot. Um, a, a point about that, Bernard, which we must always r r remark on, is this. It's, it is dogmatic that not everybody will be saved. There is a destined group whom God has foreseen will cooperate with him and will be saved. But it's, a, it's not a majority of people and it's not all the people, which is a, an era people are pushing nowadays. In other words, so the thousand years probably raked in those souls that were to, to, to be saved and would cooperate. And the remnant then has struggled since the 1700s until today. And I, I think that if one looks, and we may in these talks, in these tapes, we may touch on the evidence we now have and that Satan is having his last stand. This is his Waterloo, but he's going to kill off, destroy much, scorched earth policy, destroy as much as he can before he finally is shoved down as the abyss again, chained by Michael. And then the reign of Our Lady and uh, the Sacred Heart of Jesus will take place. I'm, I'm putting a lot of uh, doctrine and revelation and uh, conclusion into that, but that's the, the, the position of Satan. There's one more thing about Lucifer which we should remember, and it's this. Um, we have no protection against him of ourselves. No one can match him on this earth. No one. He can deceive anybody. St. Paul says that he is the transformed himself into an angel of light. And therefore, no matter how lofty you think your motive is, no matter how correct you think your doctrine is, you need protection. And that protection comes to a Catholic, a Christian, a Catholic, especially in two ways. It comes from the voice of the Church, when the Church speaks, clear, with a clear voice. Sometimes I wish our churchmen spoke with a clear voice, but anyway, the, ch the Church speaks in the magisterium, as we call it, which nowadays has been rather mute in the voices of, it, of its uh, appointed speakers. And number two, you have the protection of Michael and the angels. That's their function. And remember this, that the reason to go back to, Luther, to uh, Lucifer's beginnings, we know mm, from the fathers that the crisis between him and God consisted about Christ, concerned Christ. Apparently, to use human language, Lucifer and his angels were shown Jesus Christ as a baby and as a man wandering around Palestine, barefoot, a uh, scrawny Palestinian, with a beard and a, a robe on him, with not a penny, uh, very few pennies in the purse, and he was asked to adore him. And he was shown a vision of, of this man crucified, which is the same as being hanged. And he was told to adore this thing of clay. And he, to ask Lucifer to do that? No. He wanted to be up on the mountain of the Most High and the Congregation of the North, to be equal to God. He wasn't going to do that. So he it was, was the sin of pride? Of course, sin of pride. Sin of pride. He, he was going to be it. Now, the reason that God did that was that he gave the option to all the angels. This is going to be the situation. You will service this man and his followers. You will protect them. You will, part of you will be up beside my throne praying for them and, and making their prayers ascend to, 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 my, to, my, to my heart. 
The other part of you will be steward angels. You will guide their feet. You will guard their houses. You will protect them from wild animals. You will cure them when they are ill. You will stave them off when they are feeling guilty, when they are cruel. You will remind them that they are children of God and they are supposed to be faithful to my laws. Will you do this? Option. Freedom. All completely autonomous. L Lucifer and his people said, No, we are angels. We a thing of a lump of clay born in a bed between the legs of a woman and finally expiring and uh, being eaten by worms and you want we are immortal and you want us to so he refused so it is the sin of pride and um, that's why the old one great God is to call on the angels because we, we don't use them at all and the funny thing about the angels uh, and Lucifer is this the funny thing about the angels is that if you don't call on them they don't be very active if you call on them and expect about 40% from them they'll give you 40% if you call on them and expect 90%, they'll give you 90%. If you call on them and expect 100%, not hoping, you know, hope, as somebody said, is a very good companion but a bad guide. You must believe you're going to get 100%. If you do, you'll get 100%. It's a funny way God has of treating us. The same is true for Our Lady, too. At La Salette, when she's speaking to the two children, they said, how can we believe you, Lady, Madame? And she said, if you believe in me, I'll believe in you. There's a quid pro quo with God because he's consented to treat us like that. So with, uh, with, with Satan, with Lucifer, as I prefer to call him, um, those are the only two protections we have against him. Because St. Peter says he's like a lion going around seeking whom he may devour. And he is intent on eviscerating the church, on corrupting your soul and my soul, destroying priesthood, removing the tabernacle, destroying all chastity and purity, um, completely destroying the family and producing a world in which there is no church, there is no compassion, there is no pity, there is no love, there is no gentleness, and there is only death and pain and, and uh, destruction. You know, I work with Satanists who are reformed and they all tell me the three tests they have to go through in order to become a Satanist, an official Satanist. We'll touch on their existence, by the way, in a later, in a later conversation here today. But they have to kill show they're indifferent to death. You usually have a puppy dog or a cat or a kitten or something or a bird. And they have to burn to show a love for fire. And thirdly, they have to be cruel. Not kill, but just cruel. Cause a dog or a cat or a bird or a, a human being to scream at pain but not kill them and love to do it. That's the world of Lucifer. And by the way, if you look around at what we consider the blots in our landscape, whether it's Los Angeles or or San Francisco or New York or cities in Canada, wherever it is, or Paris or London, what we call the seamy side, the inhuman side, is always filled with what? Death, arson, cruelty to children, to women, to men. So Satan's thumb mark is everywhere, the cloven hoof. And what are devils? Devils are those angels who went with Lucifer. They, they, see, you could ask me, and many people have, how many are there? Bernard, in this room, how many people are there sitting? Two. That's right. And how do you know that? You count. One body, two bodies. Second body. Now, an angel hasn't got a body. You can't count them numerically. That's the difficulty. In that world of the spirit, there is no numerical separation because they are spirits and uh, they haven't got a body and they're spirits that cannot die so in our language there are there are zillions there are millions of them Christ said at the drop of a hat in Gethsemane standing when uh, Peter drew his sword he said put up your sword if I asked my father for one he said a legion and a legion in his mouth meant uh, hundreds of thousands of angels immediately to defend him and they're there because they don't take up any space this old thing about how many angels can stand on the, ha on the head of a pin is, uh, is, uh, is an old Protestant reproach for Catholic philosophers. Uh, the head of a pin doesn't, they don't stand on anything. They're immaterial, but they're real. They're real. And everybody has one, everybody has a guardian angel, and we are told by some, some of the fathers everybody has a devil assigned to them, depending on their character. If I'm a sensuous character, I'm one who wants to tempt me sensually and sexually. If I'm greedy and avar avaricious, it'll be for money and all the other various things. But we know from exorcism, by the way, that the devils specialize. And uh, they're very stupid outside that when you get talking to them. They're extremely stupid. But in their metier, in their actual profession, what they're experienced, whether they're intellectual or they're scientific or mathematical or what, they're very, very clever. They've they got their material pat, down pat. Um, 
exists. So they're formidable things to come up against, and they're very active. Now, why do modern theologians scoff at the very idea of the devil and um, guardian angels and the whole concept sometimes even of evil? I'll tell you what they do. Uh, but it's a short answer, and don't be, don't be dissatisfied with it until you hear the explanation of it. Simply, they belong to the apostasy. It's as short as that. What does that mean? It means they have lost their faith. If you deny the devils, if you deny the existence of Lucifer, if you deny, deny the existence of sin, of hell, of eternal punishment, you automatically deny Christ's salvation. You automatically deny God's goodness and the whole purpose of the cross. The whole incarnation is destroyed. In fact, you can't deny the existence of Lucifer without being led inevitably to deny the divinity and the function of Christ as Savior. What's the purpose in Christ's coming? What is the purpose? To make a nice land? To give us more eggs? Uh, more, uh, more happy lives on us? No, no, he came to save us from sin. It's I-N. So that's the reason. Now, the reason I say the, it's, uh, the apostasy is this, that there is evidence, and I cannot get over the evidence, and I, I'm one of millions, that we are today in the grip of the beginning of a major apostasy. That is, overnight, as it were, Bernard, in a church which 30 years ago was peopled with solid lines and ranks of clergymen and nuns and priests and lay, me, lay people, all believers, nobody, nobody ever questioning the fundamentals or even the accidentals. Overnight, we suddenly turn around, we have cardinals who don't believe and we know they don't, we have bishops that don't believe and we know they don't, we have uh, priests that don't believe and we know it, we have nuns that don't believe, we have whole segments of the population that have stopped going to mass, stopped going to confession, they don't believe any longer because there's a rule in belief which is absolutely categoric. And I, by an example, let me tell you what it is. If I say I love you, and, uh, but I never look at you, I never buy you any roses, I, I never buy you a meal, I, I don't see you at night or in the morning, I don't say good morning, good evening. The next time I tell you I love you, you can say, well, big joke. <laughs> what, is, I mean, what does love mean? I believe in God. Well, if you believe in God, then why are you violating his rules? And why do you deny the dogmas of his church, which you know is his true, true church and is infallible? So, they have lost their faith, they're apostatic, they're apostates. The difficulty is this, with disbelief. This, I make a comment about certain cardinals in the United States, uh, certainly some archbishops in Canada where you live, and many, many priests and many bishops throughout the United States. When you lose your faith, do you know you've lost it, Bernard? You don't. You couldn't, because otherwise you get it back. They don't know. They think you're stupid because you have retained these, these so-called superstitions and myths. They don't know. And that's the curse of disbelief. Once he withdraws the gift, hey, Shala, you can't believe any longer. You are incapable of it. And only his mercy can grasp you by the neck and they can lift you out of that morass. And he doesn't always do it. And remember, too, that I think we should all remember that it's very easy to lose your faith, far easier at least than you think. I need never doubt a dogma. I need never attack uh, some rule of the church. Uh, I need never criticize the Bible and yet lose my faith because I'm unfaithful to my vow of marriage if I'm married, my vow of celibacy if I'm a priest, my, vow, my, my, my obligation not to steal, if I, if I really am a thief, a robber, my, my obligation not to kill another human being, uh, not to murder them. If I violate any of those things, faith is immediately chipped away. And the, moment, uh, and the more I deepen into that, faith disappears. So I can leave my faith and say, no, no, I want to believe all those things, but I can't any longer. And the last thing to know, notice about faith is, it's not an emotion. It's knowledge, put it. What happens in faith is the will the mind proposes a proposition. God exists. God is my creator. Jesus saved me. Uh, there is a hell. The Pope is infallible. The church is the church of God outside of which there's no salvation. And my will freely locks my mind into it and says, take it, accept it, blindly, without proof. That's faith. But it's knowledge. And St. Paul says it's knowledge through a blast darkly. But that means that when I do believe, when I receive Christ in the Blessed Eucharist, when I say the Rosary, when I make the Stations of the Cross, when I go to Mass, when I fulfill my obligations in my state of life, I, I'm, I'm in contact spiritually and supernaturally with God. And I know Him, but I don't know what I know. Unless sometimes by intuition He gives me a knowledge of it, or unless I come to the hour of death and then I suddenly see all I know and all I don't know. 
So it's a knowledge, and we mustn't forget that. Satan wants to corrupt that knowledge. Now what he does is he tries to distract you. And we'll, we'll, we'll go in, if you wish, later on, we'll, or any time you like, we'll go into his methods of getting at your faith, how to see undermine it. Let's do that right now. Okay. The way he does it is as follows. Remember, there's a cardinal rule this, uh, uh, this idiot uh, angel must observe, and it is that he can only touch your senses. He cannot touch your soul unless you've given it to him, unless you've, you're possessed. And even then he has difficulties. It's a roundabout process for him. All he can do is enter your soul through the normal means. What are the normal means? It's this. You have five senses, your whole body, okay? And then you have inside you a thing called imagination. It's a faculty. And that faculty has pictures. And you have a memory which recalls those pictures, okay? Now, we get our normal pictures. I'm, you're sitting in this room, and if you look over to that wall there, you see a mirror, a beveled mirror. And if you look over there, there are blue books and brown books and yellow books and photographs and, uh, and busts, heads of people that, are, that live here. And there are, there are icons hanging on the wall and there are candlesticks. All those images have already gone into your m m imagination or are stored away there. And uh, with a good memory, you can pick them all out and recall them all. That's the way you get images. And because you have a mind that thinks, and you have me talking at you, you'll understand what these icons mean, what those books tell, and what those candlesticks are used for, and who are these people whose busts are up on the shelf there. Um, so it's through images, though. Now, if he can implant images on your imagination, they're transmitted to your mind and so. That's the only way to go. So, um, he will plant from images on me unless I'm careful. That's why one must watch one's imagination and one's eyes. Because if you go out in the street out there, but at the present moment, and see a mother eviscerating her baby, you will not take your eyes off it. And it will be a memory you will never lose. If you turn on the, the, the boob tube, as we call it in the States, the television, and you see some obscene action between two people, male, female, male, male, female, female, whatever, the, the garbage we see now is the pornography, you see that, and you follow all the details, it is in you. You have the image, and that is a ready tool for him to suggest to you various things that you could do. Or if you uh, uh, look at money in, in a certain way, uh, piles of dollars or whatever it is, or gold, or somebody's, possess, uh, somebody's very valuable necklace, and you lust after it, the image goes into you. He has the means, therefore, of working on you. And that's all he needs is one toe hold, and he has you by the neck, the scruff of the neck. So that's why... It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always laughed at nowadays by the, the very, very uh, uh, advanced avant-garde in these matters, but what they used to call custody of the eyes and custody of the hands. And there is no man alive who can uh, uh, lay immodest hands on a woman without being tempted. Uh, he, he's not made of flesh. Psychologically, he has to be. And vice versa. So you've got to watch how you touch and what you look at and what you listen to. Because the voice can be a terrible medium of persuasion, as you and I know. Um, and those are, the big, uh, the, those are the means by which Satan enters. Now, it doesn't mean that you've got to go around like, uh, like a, a barbed wire camp, watching everything, refusing to look at things, refusing to talk. No. There's a, we can develop in a child and in a man, or uh, a woman, you can develop the habits of self-control so that they feel the impact of something, but they, they easily get out of it. They're not fascinated by it. The difficulty about the television is that that's all it is, a terminal image that attracts you and fills you. There's nothing beyond it, there's no depth. That's how Satan works. He works on individuals in that way, but he's a geopolitician, and he has plans for the entire world. And his plans, at that level, go to the bureaucracies, go to the the uh, boardrooms, go to the CEO's office, go to the government uh, parliament uh, and, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, civil and federal and um, state uh, governments. And there they influence individuals as a group. And we have examples of that in the United States and Canada too. In the United States we have that as regards the appro approval of homosexuality, homosexual marriages, uh, the approval of pornography as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an example of art, if you please, and all the other things that, uh, that are, he's by groups he works. And once you get a group of people together in a phalanx, peer pressure makes them all move in the same direction, but behind it all there's that grinning face of the, of the old goat who's got what he wanted through his surrogates. That's how he works.
It's interesting that you mentioned the point that he works through reaching the senses, because I was in a bookstore once, and I picked up a Satanist Bible, and it said that the key principle of Satanism was that of indulgence, whereas a key principle of Christianity is that of sacrifice. That's right. That's right. You see, the, 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 the two words that are whispered in everybody's the ear of every soul, so to speak, by the tempter is, why not? Why not have it? Especially if it's what they call a victimless action. Nobody's hurt by it. You just enjoy yourself. You get your gold, you get your woman, you get your man, you get your boy, you get your food, you get whatever you want, illegally. Why not? And it is self-indulgence. And for that phrase, why not, embodies exactly the principle that he, he uses. And we used to, we, he trains us to use with ourselves. Why not have it? You're doing it no harm to nobody. It's victimless. Uh, and you have a right to it. And uh, it belongs to John Smith or uh, Mabel Kelly. But after all, you're just as good as them. And they won't know anyway. And it won't hurt them. And uh, they have no right to them. They're too stupid. So why not have it, my friend? It's self-indulgence. And it's the hardest thing in the world, Bernard, I find, in the pastoral work I do, to tell good, solid citizens, no, you have to make a sacrifice. And they'll say, well, why? I haven't committed a sin. It's, it's, it's not so much that. It is that if you do curb your self-indulgence, even legitimate self-indulgence, because you're not supposed to touch illegitimate self-indulgence. But if you do curb legitimate self-indulgence, like that extra uh, chocolate eclair, self-indulgence of various kinds, um, once we start on that road, and, if you, if, and I find it very hard to inculcate to a lot of good people that, you no, know, you make voluntary sacrifices to train yourself. Because this is a warfare. It's, uh, and asceticism, as you know, means exercise. The original Greek word means to exercise oneself in the gladi as a gladiator, as a fighter in the amphitheater, at the games. You have to be active and curbing things just to be able to say, I can say no. That's why a total addiction to smoking or to drinking, apart from the alcohol part of it, drinking, or to chocolate or to anything, a total addiction. There's something wrong in it, there's something unchristian, there's something sinful, at least venially sinful. You are self-indulgent. And you can't do that. Nature will come against you, and finally your soul will suffer from it. Let's move on now to the topic of uh, exorcism and possession. Mm. And you wrote a book called Hostage to the Devil, actually, a number of years ago. That's right. We'll bring out another edition of that, because the, although we still have a lot of copies to sell of the, of the old edition and the paperback edition, we decided that we need a new um, preface, because things have gone... Uh, when I wrote that book in 1975, I wrote it for one reason and one reason only, Bernard. I wrote it because I found that my contemporaries in America and in Canada and Australia and Ireland had forgotten what it was all about. They didn't know what exorcism was. And there was a very funny picture called The Exorcist by William, based on the book by William Blatty, which is totally erroneous as regards uh, exorcism. It's a phony exorcism because it makes out exorcism to be a sort of a combination of Frankenstein and Dracula with a lot of green goo and windows breaking and bodies flying. And it's much more terrible and lethal than that. So I decided, since I was in exorcisms and doing in that field, doing a lot of work, that I would get, with permission, the transcripts of five to ten exorcisms and publish them as such with a preface. I found, of course, I could only publish five of them because they were lengthy. Some of these exorcisms were 400 hours. Some of them were five days. So they were long. The normal exorcism takes, and nowadays anyway, the major exorcism takes anything up to three or four weeks. And it's, it's, we always take um, photographs, and videos, and we take radio, and we take a tape a recording of the whole thing. Recording. So I decided to publish that. And um, having published it, then in the northeast corner of America, where I work in this field, we had about, oh, I would say about. 40 major exorcisms per year, but thousands of minor exorcisms. Because exorcism is divided into two parts. First of all, let's talk about a little bit about possession. What happens is that somebody gives voluntarily, gives themselves, gives their soul to Lucifer in this sense that they consent to be his worshipper and servitor. It sounds as if nobody would do it, but thousands do it and we can explain the process by which that's done. Anyway, the point comes the point of possession. And possession means that you no longer possess your own will. It's the will only. There is a myth that 
the devil enters into your body. The devil can't enter into your body because he hasn't got a body to enter your body with. Do you understand me? He's not, he's not a physical shape. But do you remember Hitler, that bold, bad man Hitler? He possessed the wills and the minds of millions of Germans. He never entered their bodies. He caught their will. So if I can control your mind and your will, I, I possess you. And the greater, my, the, the, the greater the extent of my possession, the greater is my hold over you. And you can see that in, when we had that awful man, uh, I think his name was Steinberg, with uh, Lisa, his, his uh, common-law wife, and they, he made her cr be cruel to this little child who died finally. Uh, in this, we had this awful case two years ago in New York. It's a case of some man dominating a woman, sometimes a woman dominating a man, so dominating that they are their servants. The slaves. That's the nature of possession. Except that once the spirit has been allowed to get power in you, it is very hard to break it. You can't break away. You must do it voluntarily, by the way. There's no such thing as involuntary possession. You don't wake up one morning and say, my goodness, the devil has possessed me. That doesn't happen. You have asked him in. And he finally arrives, bag and baggage, scrip and scrippage, to stay forever. Now, that's possession. People often confuse it with what we call obsession. Obsession is where he's softening you up, if I can use that expression, about a horrible process, where you're being harassed. And it's very much like this. Supposing I start harassing you, Bernard, and I say, if you don't give me uh, $2,000, and I know you have it in your pocket, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to uh, injure your wife. I'm going to um, damage your children. I'm going to ruin your reputation. And I keep harassing you. And you get letters about this and telephone calls. And uh, you get, uh, I meet you suddenly in the street. I meet your wife and say, does your husband know how dangerous, what dangerous position he's put you into? I get the children at the playground and I say, your daddy is a very bad man. He's going to have you killed. I harass him. I harass you. That's, and all it does is persuade your family to do my will. That's, and the will is, let me in, please. Let me possess you. Give me your will. That's uh, obsession. Many people get into terrible conditions of melancholia, have to go to a shrink or a doctor. It never strikes them that what they are is they're being harassed by Satan. Sometimes it happens a man who is not very happy in his marriage, but it's fixed. He doesn't want to leave his wife. And he's uh, harassed about another, wo another woman who is available. He's harassed, but he's harassed and say, listen, if you, don't, if you don't take this woman and have an affair with her, sleep with her, have her as your mistress, you're going to break up physically. Your nerves need this. So it's harassed from that point of view. So the harassment, we say har harassment in America, but I was trained in England and Ireland, so I say harassment. I hope people understand the word. Harassment is another thing completely. That's obsession. You're being, you're besieged. Now, possession is, once it sets in, is uh, something from which you cannot extricate yourself. The only person that can extricate you is Christ. Christ normally doesn't do it directly. He delegates that to his apostles, and those are the bishops of the church. And the bishops must therefore authorize every exorcism. Unfortunately, nowadays, most of the bishops I know don't believe in the devil. They, or if they believe in the vague sort of principle of evil or something, they certainly don't believe in possession. They think you should go to a shrink. And they do send ordinary faithful to come. I, I've stopped sending them to certain bishops now. They send them off to see a local shrink and go to a home, rest up, get drugs. And uh, it only makes it worse. Makes it worse. And it's a terrible plight. But that's due to the the lack of faith in bishops and priests. Then, even when the bishop does believe, the parish priest doesn't, and he, he laughs, them out of, laughs them out of the confessional. And, um, Bernard, I could spend my whole life just talking to people about their possession and obsession and advising them what to do. It's one of the biggest um, needs today. We can expand on the why it's necessary today. Uh, because there's a, when I, as I saw, I told you a moment ago, when we started, when I started in 1975 in this field, there were about 40 to 50, 50, 60, perhaps, major exorcisms per day, per, per, per year, and there are thousands of small ones. Now, there has been an increase of over 750% since 1975, and that is terrible. That is terrible. Um, and the, 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 there is no sign of this diminishing. And unfortunately, Satanism and possession have taken a very ugly turn. They've become Satanist pedophilia. Let me explain that. In other words, 
the Satanist, and in this country alone, in America, not in the USA, there are about, we know of 8,072, 8,773 8, covens, that is, satanic groups, professionally devoted to worshipping Satan. And remember, that means victims, and it means black masses, and it means uh, gross irreverence and sacrilege of the blessed host and the, the precious blood every day. It means all that. Uh, so, Satanism is spread very far and wide. Um, but it has now attained a, a, a height or depth of iniquity that rarely exceeded before. It is this. The normal Satanist group looks for a child, preferably a little boy, to be the victim. And unspeakable horrors are, are committed on that poor victim. They love that. That is the supreme sacrifice. Because remember, Satan set out to destroy a child once, and he was foiled. And that child, Jesus, grew up to be a man and destroyed Satan's empire and sent him scurrying back to hell. And he is the enemy. So he wants to take out on as many children as he can. Hence his delight in abortion. And uh, there are about 400 million abortions per year throughout the world that we know of. Probably many more than that. But 400 million babies are sacrificed by a knife or by cruelty, um, by some form of uh, murderous cruelty, just to satisfy Satan's whim. And that's the terrible thing about mothers who wake up to the fact that they committed this sin. The trauma is so deep, sometimes they, you can do nothing for them at all, except pray. Uh, but Satan is being paid that tribute per year in this world. That's probably why one reason why we all know there's a chastisement coming. Nothing but chastisement can clean this out. We've gone so far down the road. Now, you mentioned that in these covens, yeah. they hold black masses. Sure. What are black masses? In the entire practice of genuine Satanism, the principle is to do everything backwards. The crucifix is always there, a crucifix hung upside down. A black mass consists of taking the Roman mass, not the Novus Ordo, because they don't believe that's a real mass. Uh, they take the, or the, the Roman mass and they say it backwards. They start at the last gospel and they work their way back to the beginning, uh, except the words of consecration and the consecration itself, which is always said, if it's a genuine black mass, by a, a priest, an apostate priest. So it's definitely there's a consecration of bread and wine, and they're violated. Um, but before you go to start a satanic mass, they make you go to confession. And in confession, what do you do? You confess the sins you didn't commit. Because that's what you have offended Satan in. You haven't, you haven't helped him along at all. You didn't commit that adultery. You didn't steal that money. You didn't kill that boy. You, you didn't, uh, whatever. You didn't tell that lie you could have told. You weren't, uh, you weren't, um, Whatever sin you could have committed, you didn't. You confessed that sin. The worshippers are always naked, um, and they have an altar. It's a regular mass. And on the altar, they always have the naked body of the victim, whoever he or she is. Um, and the details are too uh, noisome and uh, repugnant for most people to know. And even when you come across somebody who's been through it, they have this blank look at the back of their eyes, but as you know, will never fade out. You know they always have this. Uh, even though they repent. But uh, even in normal life, they, there's a part of their soul which has been withered, like your arm being withered. Hmm? Nothing can be done about it. Nothing. Uh, because the, 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 the blasphemy and sacrilege of a mass, of a black mass, is so deep that once you go through that, and I've never been at one, of course, I would never go to one, but once you go through it and participate in it, then you've done something to your soul that only Christ can uh, cure and I I don't know how many of them ever get out of it ever again the last case we had was a woman and she couldn't she could she, she could tell us about it but she couldn't get out she had to go back they held her with an iron grip and no psychiatry no psychology no therapy could undo that she couldn't be persuaded she said kill me kill me and let me free and she felt a will commit suicide and we can't stop it and then Satan is served because as you know suicide is the eighth sacrament for Lucifer. That's what it's called, the eighth segment. Can we talk now a bit about uh, exorcism? Sure. What is exorcism? Who does it? How is it done? Well, the exorcism, first of all, must be done with the authority of a, a bishop 
who always gives it to a priest. There have been lay exorcists, by the way, in history. In times of want, bishops will take a very holy man and uh, tell him to uh, perform exorcism with permission. But normally it's a priest, because uh, <coughs> although many people do not realize it nowadays, once a priest's hands are consecrated, then there is a change in his soul. Once a priest's hands are consecrated, then there is a change in his soul, a spiritual change, which you will never lose again. And no matter how many priests say they're ex-priests and it's all over, and it was a nice job, and now they're doing something else, they will find out on the last day, if they haven't found out before they die, that their soul has been sealed away by God, and if they cover that soul with sin, that's their business but it still belongs to God in a special way. Now, that soul of a priest, though, sinless, normally sinless, and good, and saying Mass, and doing his duty as a priest, is one thing Satan hates, because it's, it's a reproduction of Christ, and uh, uh, the name that the devils in exorcism use for Christ, they never say Christ. They always say the nameless one, the great weakling, the milk toast, always holding insults at him, the carpenter from Nazareth, you can force them to say Christ, but then they're going to take it out of you. It's, you know, I did it once, and they punish you. And it's not a nice punishment at all. So you don't provoke them more than you need to. Now, so it must be a priest, and he must have authority from the bishop. I know bishops, and we've gone to them and said, look, uh, John so-and-so or Mary so-and-so down the street in your diocese, they need exorcism, Your Honor, Your Excellency. And they've said, look, I know nothing about it, I want to know less, you have the authority, but never ask me again. They, they, they're, they, they're afraid of it, they, they don't believe it, they're afraid not to believe it completely, uh, they don't have anything to do with it. Anything to do with it. I know one bishop who's not like that, and he shall remain nameless, and um, he's regarded as, a, as a, an eccentric by his fellow bishops, because he believes in the devil, and believes in exorcism, and has a full-time exorcist. In the Archdiocese of New York, there's no full-time exorcist, we get them from out of town. Uh, and that's not reflecting on the cardinal here, he does believe in the devil, we know. He does believe in possession, that it does occur. He does believe in exorcism, too. But there are, there are difficulties against this archdiocese appointing an exorcism that don't come from the cardinal, they come from the chancery. Um, that means some of his subordinates will have nothing to do with it. So we have to put up with that. In other dioceses, there is no exorcist, and the bishop doesn't believe in it, and the priest don't believe in it, and there's no help for you. And I could, uh, if I were paid, uh, say $20 for every exorcism I was asked to do in the last 30 years, or I could retire. I could have a fleet of assistants doing them on the side. Uh, the, the amount of people who know they're possessed and have deliberately walked into this trap and then can't do anything about it because there's no priest uh, and there's no bishop willing to help them and the bishop laughs them out of court. And the pathetic letters I get, which I can never publish, what the bishop said to them and told them to do, go away and have a good steak, a blood stair, blood red steak, and have a good love bottle of beer. If your wife go and make love with her, if you haven't, well, uh, take care of yourself, do something nice, which means go out to the local brothel or something like that. Um, the, it's lack of faith. Again, we come back to the apostasy, because uh, the first thing Satan wants to make sure is that you think he doesn't exist. It's, it's the old principle. I remember when we, when we were being instructed in intelligence, in Rome, in the Vatican, because we were doing some intelligence work. They taught us, they tried to teach us anyway, some of them never picked it up, to be anonymous. So you could be in a crowd, nobody would notice you. The idea is you don't exist. We're here, but we don't exist. And that's why the great laugh Lucifer has at times is that he moves in jackboots in the boardrooms and bedrooms and in government offices and the parliament houses, and um, he doesn't exist. It's a myth, it's a joke. What a marvelous cover. What a marvelous cover. If Hitler or Stalin had spies of that caliber, they could have us in the bag long ago. He has us in the bag in this sense, uh, because he has developed a sense of humor about old Nick, and we have a portrait of a, a black-looking man with big ears and uh, yellow eyes and a forked tail and cloven hooves and dirty books under his arm behind a bush saying, Psst, come here, I'll teach you how to sin. Satan is too urbane. He's too bland, he's too clever, he won't do that. Uh, it's, too, it's too studied an approach. Um, so 
That's exorcism for you, and who must do it? Exorcism itself is a ceremony which the, the church has a fixed form for exorcism. You find it in a normal prayer book. And nowadays, the prayer books don't have it precisely because the bishops dropped it and they, in the prayer books. They were submitted for the, were submitted them for their for their uh, approval. But uh, it's lengthy prayers, traditional prayers, calling on Saint Michael, and then there are other prayers that you put in. But a lot of it is left up to the exorcist because at a certain moment, I must turn around and say to you, the possessed person, "Who are you?" And an, an exorcist never obeys, never answers a question. He asks a question. He never answers a question of the possessed person. Who are you? What do you come? What do you come here to? You can hear these people say this. Well, why do you come here to bother me? We'll do nothing to you. Leave us alone, please, Martin. Leave us alone, please. Oh, well, what do you want? Do you want women? Do you want money? Do you want food? Go away and have it. Leave us alone. What are you doing here? Never ask a question. Say, who are you? You keep at it and you find their names. They all have a name. Ugly names. Sinister names. Sardonic names. Names that laugh at hum human beings. Names that, that d d d make a joke of the loveliest things in the human body and the human mind. Always this awful, dirty touch thing. And uh, once you do that, you have them nailed. Because then they obey that name. They are constant that name. And then you say, you proceed to find out who sent them, how do they come here, when, what's your speciality, what do you do? And uh, it's like a dog trying to get away from you when you're after them. It's like a dog. And it'll bite your hand. It'll bite you mortally if you're not careful. Um, and the, the, fail, the failed exorcists are those who fell into the trap of answering questions. Because it's very interesting. And some of them are entrancing, humanly speaking. And they get tied up in it. And of course, before long, their will is going with the other, with the possessed, with the possessing demon's will, and they're stuck. And then other people are caught and badly injured because they do it without permission. And I know a very famous man in this country, whom I helped to instruct in um, exorcism, with a warning. He was a layman and not a Catholic. And don't attempt it. Don't do it by yourself. He did, and he's possessed. Now, when you read about the normal possessed person that's brought to an exorcist to be exorcised. They're, they're always violent, they smell sometimes, and, and they're cursing, and they're a social pain in the neck to everybody, and they're a liability to their family, and they burn themselves, and they, they hit their head against things, they scream, and, and then they, they're most unhygienic, they go to the bathroom any place, and they shock you, it smells, and, and all that sort of stuff. They're not doing that to hurt you. They are like the baby who's hungry, can't tell you, and is hitting his head against the ground. Do you ever see a baby do that? When they're with the, they, it's the way they have a signaling. They're trying to create pain to absorb pain in their tummies, which are, which are empty, uh, supposedly. But they're also signaling. When you see that, you know a baby saying, I'm hungry. Similarly with a possessed person who's misbehaving themselves, as I've just described, in these thousand and one awful, disgusting ways. Disgusting burn is the only word. The smell, the sight, the sound, the words, the actions, I mean, they dehumanize you. You never recover from it. Not really. It takes away a bit of your soul and leaves that with God until you get back to heaven and he reintegrates it. But uh, they're saying, help me. I'm in trouble. They can't describe it. Some of them attempt to and then they shut up and, and then the, the, possession, the devil takes over, the possession, the possessing spirit takes over and they then proceed to act in another coy way. I remember once being asked to interview a woman who was a paraplegic in a, in a bath chair, in a, in a wheelchair, and um, she spoke long about the wounds of Jesus, and about Jerusalem, and about the Pope, and, the, and then proceeded to try and seduce me in a very subtle way. So it was only Satan using words that meant nothing at all, just using Christian words. Um, now, there is another poem of possession which is terrible, and it's called Perfect Possession. I've only met a bare half dozen of perfectly possessed people. You see, when possession takes place, although you can't break from it, you know. And if the grace of God comes to you, or if something happens that jogs your mind, you're the grace of God finally, and you want to get out of it, uh, you can finally get out of it. And if God sends you the grace, probably he's going to send you the means of being exorcised. But some people don't want to. Some people actually want to be possessed. 
they want to be holy worshippers. I've met them, believe in me, it's as real as the nose on your face. And when they're publicly possessed, they're completely urbane and calm and clean and efficient. They're good doctors, they're good lawyers, they're good architects, they're good bankers, they're good painters, they're good artists, they're good dancers. They're beautiful people. Die schöne Leute, as the Germans used to say. Uh, but they're not schöne at all. They're not beautiful at all. But they're perfectly possessed. Except now and again, in an off moment, when they don't think you're looking at them, you see this face. You see this. I knew one very well in England. No, Ireland he was, I knew, but I met him in England later. On. And um, at, at first, the first go over, it just seemed to be sort of a very metallic sort of a voice and a, and a sort of a very sort of business-like way of talking. It wasn't much of the milk of human kindness, but I've known so many people who know milk, milk of the human kindness, as Shakespeare has it, that it doesn't surprise me in this hard world of ours. But now and again, and I got to know him, we were working together on a project, and therefore I got to know his movements and his, the way he dressed, and he used to wear perfume, some eau de cologne, uh, perfectly legitimate, and I knew the way he talked and the sound of his voice and his quirks of raising his head like that when he was thinking, looking up to the left. And um, I got to know him. And once or twice he came in to see me. Once or twice I saw him alone in a st brown study. He didn't know I was there. And I said to myself, I don't know that man. That's an alien. That's alien. And finally it hit my belly that he was totally alien inside. And I had a conversation with him about it. And since I was what I was, he, he opened up somewhat. But in a very veiled way, but he told me. But there's this alien touch. You suddenly find out, I don't know this man. I, I thought I did. He's utterly alien. And it's this look. It's a frightening look. And uh, just, and most people when they need it, just say, well, he's crazy or he's a, he's a pain in the neck or something. They don't bother about it. Um, but it's, uh, it's their perfectly possessed. You never touch them. You walk away from it. Never try to wait to them because they're completely gone. They've given in completely. and They're Faust. They've signed the document for their soul to go. And um, it's a terrible thing. The extent of it is very big today. Um, as I say, we have about eight, over 8,000. It's, it's 842. 8,042 were the last count I saw. These are worshipping covens composed of not ignorant men and women, not people who are stupid, on the road, homeless, jobless, you know. No, these are doctors, lawyers, architects, brokers, painters, dancers, um, nuns, priests, cardinals, pri bishops. Some of these people are in powerful positions then? My dear man, the last coven we had to deal with indirectly through this woman, I mean, it was a galaxy of names. If you want anything done in medicine or in finance in New York, or Albany, just be in the Coven. Absolutely top black people and perfectly well behaved in normal life. Family member, family men, men and women, uh, society members, you know, they, they were known to people and some of them are very, very well, well known names in their, their world, the part of the world in New York and probably in Washington too. Uh, I, 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 it's only the perfectly possessed that frighten myself. I met some of them in Washington and some of them elsewhere in this country. And they all frighten me because they're completely dedicated. It's like meeting a complete and utter Russian spy or spy for the Soviet Union in those bad days. In America, once you meet them, you know, they're, they're going to betray everything without mercy. Similarly with them too. They, they, it is an unpleasant thing. And my advice to anybody about it is this. Know about exorcism, know about possession, know how to avoid the devil's inroads, but do not touch it otherwise. It is mucky, dirty, insalubrious, unhealthy, inhuman, and not to be thought about. It's like <laughs> the old priest who instructed me originally in, in Cairo said to me, Malachi, he said, this whole thing is like a bowel movement. We have to deal with it, but he said it is not to be thought about. <laughs> he was an Irishman. That was his way of putting it. It's uh, his, way, his way of saying that uh, don't touch it, keep away from it. Unless you have to. Now, you must inform yourself, and therefore some book like mine is useful to you, very useful because it's above board. Some of the language is hard to carry, and I don't advise certain people who ask me for the book. I say, no, no. When I know them, I say, no, don't read the book yet. Wait for a couple of years. Especially if they're young, and especially if they're very sort of tender in the, 
they can't face brutal facts very easily. Some people can't. Um, so I don't advise them to, to read the book, but I say to anybody, you should know about it and know the details, but you needn't go into any great... And the all, watch out the trap they made for you. Don't use the Ouija board. Don't attend spiritual seances. Uh, don't use cards to tell fortunes. Don't do transcendental meditation. Don't do Ron Hubbard's course. You will end up, one way or the other, with harassment at least, if not possession. And you won't know it, because you've been trained by these systems to do it. But so don't. Keep away from it. Why are only certain priests delegated to be exorcists? Why can't just any priest do an exorcism? Strictly speaking, any priest could, if he's delegated. But experience has shown the following, Bernard. The typical exorcist is not a very poetic minded character. He's not flowery. He's not a, a first-class humanist. He's usually a very stolid character uh, with what we call good moral judgment. You know the type? Sometimes they're boring, by the way. Very boring, because they're, they're straight and uh, clear-minded, and for them, they shortest distance between two points is a straight line uh, and they don't indulge in in wild superstitions or wild romanticism or as I say in poetry number one number two they have to be a proven moral character and that is that that's one of the reasons why young priests can't be because when you're young you haven't proved yourself I think that by the age of 45 or 50 if you have careful superiors careful careful bishops careful parish priests they know you they know you're predictable predictable number two number three they must have good theology because without good theology you can be deceived you can undertake an exorcism of a person man, man or woman boy or girl and the answers you get if you're not able to judge them they can deceive you that the exorcism is done that there's no devil there there's no possession there you can be deceived uh, so that's the first, that's the first three qualifications. And not everybody fits into that. In fact, if you take a roster of priests nowadays, I meet the young priests coming out of the seminaries. I never, I, there's one man, yes, there's one man. He's going to be ordained next June. With time, he might develop into it. But we don't breed this type of animal any longer. Then, you see, there's also this about that many priests, and I know them, have refused. Why? Bernard, there's an unconscious an invisible toll on the human spirit once you do exorcisms. What is it like? Well, let me give you the example, say, of a father and a mother. I, you must know hundreds of fathers and mothers. I certainly do. And when I talk to them, they have loved their children and reared their children. Now they're, they're grandmothers. They are, they're very near becoming grandfathers and grandmothers. Um, you find them continually saying, oh, no, I, I, gave, I gave that son. I gave him all I got. I gave him everything. I, and they'll tell you what they did in order to bring him to where he succeeded, or, or his, his daughter, or her daughter, their mother and father talking about them. They're always saying, implying, that in order to love them properly as their father or their mother, they had to give up themselves. And they're not talking about money. They also gave money. They're talking about time. They gave time. Or their, 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 their embrace, their kiss, their encouragement. They, they mean all those things too. What they really mean is they've given something of themselves. And I remember one father said to me, um, about a son at West Point at the graduation and the boy was feckless he was so happy <laughs> over his graduation that he couldn't come back and tell his father about certain ceremonies that father wanted to hear about because the father himself had graduated 50 years before that and he wanted to hear his son tell about the secret celebrations that the cadets have when they're, when they're, that the officers have when, they're, when they graduated and he said to me sort of uh, almost with tears in that he said you know, I'll never know what happened he said Malachi he, he will never tell me and he said, I gave him, I, the, I can't take back what I gave him, because I gave him part of me. And it's true, and a mother will know that she has invested so much love in that child that she could never do it again. And it's, if you really love a woman as a man, or if a woman loves a man as her husband, once they give that love, you can't do it. It's only done once, really once. And then you haven't got to give. You give a part of yourself. There's this peculiar transmission of the soul in its fruitful capacity. Now, an exorcist has to do that. Every time you do an exorcism or assist in an exorcism, you diminish your, your what will I call it? 
it's it's like as if you it's like it's something like that if you worked so hard with your arm that you strained it beyond it will never get back to its original pristine condition of being a good strong arm or a good strong foot you, you some vitality some spiritual vitality goes away and angels as I know when they chat they normally sort of speak about it as that it's a part of them God has taken away and have to wait till they die. And uh, the old exorcists I know are men who are very denuded of self and very calm. There's great composure, because peace is always the result of good exorcism. Peace, great peace, deep peace. When a person is exorcised and they come out of it and they're cured, but there's a look on their face that you'd, you'd pay gold to see because it even communicates itself to you. It's a, it's a majestic composure. They've suddenly woken up to the fact that they're children of God. They're clean. And I think it's because normally your angel accompanies you and has that sort of a, an atmosphere around him and communicates it unconsciously to you. And they have it back. And they no longer have this shadow, as one man describes to me, always the side of your eyes. You can never see it out of, except on the side of your eyes, but you know it's there. And it possesses you, it holds you. You do what it says, whether it's masturbation or stealing or killing or lying or what. It's always there. It has to grow up. do this and you do it automatically. It's slavery. It's slavery. Now, uh, so that's why I'm, it's limited. Thirdly, then, there's the fact that, uh, that, that so that people will, won't do it. I'm not pleased said, no, I won't, Your Grace. You can find it, complain to Rome, defrock me, but I'm not going to do an exorcism. I'm not one man just wouldn't. And the bishop said, why? He said, because I can't do it, he said. I'll fall. I love lots of things I read in these books. He's a very honest man. He's still a priest and a good priest, but he knew his own weakness. I've known intellectual priests who said, no, I can't do that because I'd be trapped. I, I'll make a mistake. It's a different type of man. It's a, it's a very solid... They, they, it's the type you find engineers are. Good, solid engineers, you know. They look at the thing, they measure the planks, they can measure the out their eyes, and they, they deal with hardcore figures. And there's no airy-fairy castles in their mind. Uh, very compromised. So it's the it's that type of mind. Now, doubt as anybody can. I knew one exorcist who was a young man, and um, he was forced into the position because of his bishop and the subject, the, the exorcist, as they say. But he was too fine, and he died. And it worried. It broke him. It broke him in two. He just couldn't take the the horror because you must be able to stand a terrible stench. I'm not saying physically that too, but in your in the nostrils of your soul, there's such a thing. And that's a way of putting it. The, the disgust. You're, you're dealing with something which is disgusting to your nature. And people should realize that when something is disgusting like that to your nature, it means Christ within you is disgusted. It's Christ if you have, if you have him with you. Just as if you are revolted by cruelty and are sad at human iniquity, that is Christ expressing his sadness and his uh, revol disgust at it. So if you have that, but for some people, he doesn't give them the strength to control that, and that you have pity on them. And the bishop doesn't force them. Uh, if the bishop believes, that's the difficulty. So that's why they limit it. Uh, and then the last principle the church has is never let a whole crowd of fellows go around exorcism, because they, I mean, there could be chaos. You know, and there was a time in Europe when everybody was considered to be a witch who wasn't a nun, or something like that, or didn't give good contributions to the local cathedral. So you had because of friars and Dominican friars and Franciscan friars going around exorcising people ad lib. And of course, there's an abuse. And they always condemned a lot of wrong people, uh, wrongly, they condemned people. During yeah. exorcisms, is holy water used, or is it composed purely of prayers? We don't understand. God has given us the means of knowing. But Apart, you see, God's presence in the world is, comes in various play, ways. His chief presence is that he maintains it in existence. He, his power runs right through everything, through the angels. The steward angels, as they call them, six choirs of the nine angels, of the nine choirs, have nothing to do but to maintain that, maintain that world in equilibrium. The world of matter, the world of mind, the world of movement, the world of oceans and lands, and, and the whole thing. That's one presence he has. Another presence uh, that God has in, in this life um, amongst men is the sacramental presence, his body and blood and soul and divinity are present in that tabernacle. Um, now, uh, a third presence is through sacramentals. What are those? Those are things which the church has had from the very beginning. Uh, a crucifix, specially blessed and hanging on the wall, a rosary beads, um, a chaplet, uh, say uh, the, the, 
the, uh, the salmon stock, the scapula, um, holy water, uh, holy bread, uh, whatever, whatever is, God gets a special blessing from God and therefore becomes a special part of the incarnation of divinity in this stuff and matter of our world. Holy water is like that. The power of sacramentals is traditionally known to be limited by your faith. It's like the story of the old woman, you know, who had this awful hill to climb up and to go down before she got to the church. She used to go, want to go to Mass every day. And she, um, finally the priest said to her, Katie, make a novena. Christ said, faith will move mountains. Make a nine-day novena. And you can shift the, shift the mountain with your faith. So she did for nine days. The story goes, it's an Irish story, which probably never happened, but anyway, or it, perhaps it did, but in another way. And finally, as she used to look out every morning to the mountain and say, ha, ha, you'll be gone in nine days, or you'll be gone in eight days, you'll be gone in seven days. And uh, the night before she went to bed, she looked out of the mountain and said, you won't be there in the morning, I'll go have a flat wa walk over to Mass. Well, when she got up in the morning, the mountain was still there, so she said, I knew you'd be there all the time. She really didn't believe. So, our, our, the power of, our, of our, the sacramental of making this, this novena, a novena is a sacramental of another kind, was not work. You must believe, must have faith. And if always knows the saints, whether it's Padre Pio or whoever, John Bosco or St. Ignatius, they always use something. Christ himself, remember, he used to mix mud with his spittle and put it in your ears and, uh, in order to show that sacramentals had power if you have the faith. And he had the power and he had the faith. So, holy water is used and holy water is very powerful. And uh, as you know, there, there's a French expression, when you want to say somebody's very uncomfortable, you say it's like Lucifer in a holy water font. And uh, it does make, they dislike holy water very much. Like crucifixes too, but holy water and Lord's water. That Lord's water is very, very powerful water, we find. But holy water, any holy water is, there should always be holy water in the house. And we should bless ourselves with it. Uh, but in an exorcism, it's used extensively. And it doesn't burn them, it just drives them crazy. In the exorcism, the picture, the priest shook some water on them, and it was sort of as if it was burning natural glycerin or something. But it wasn't that. It's the any approach of divinity is torture, is torture. So yes, holy water is used, and uh, crucifix is used, and holy candles are used. Um, sometimes there's a danger with those because they're blown out, they're kicked, they're thrown, they're spat upon, they're, they're split in three ways. I've seen candles split down like zigzag, like there's when somebody ran a knife through them, things you can't describe to people. Um, the temperature in the room can change, can go from freezing cold, five below, to 100 degrees within the drop of a hat. So very dramatic things can happen during exorcism. Very, very. If, they, if, they, if the demon is very angry and very powerful, he can make mistakes. Uh, or if there's a big prize at stake, then you can spit a dirty struggle. Um, sometimes the demon is extremely stupid. You can trap it and maliciously. Because you're the killer. Or he's, it's the killer. There's no here, there's no... No mercy. There's no humor. There's sardonic, schadenfreude, as Germans say, laughing at somebody's hurt, but there's no real humor or wit in it at all. Um, so yes, holy water is used, and a lot of other things are used too, like that. Now, are exorcisms sometimes performed on places or objects? Yes, you can exercise a place or an object. A room is obsessed. A room is possessed. A room can be obsessed too. Just as a, what they call the pulse guy's syndrome, you know, it's really it's on its way to possession. Why did that, that takes place? We don't know exactly. We have guesses, and we the church has always had reasons for thinking. And theologians have, and then saints have given us revelations. But there's nothing dogmatically fixed why places are, are, are obsessed. But we know they are possessed and obsessed. Usually, there are places where there's been a gross injustice, or there's a murder or there's a body buried unknown, or there's been a severe desecration of the, the, the Holy, uh, Holy Communion or the Mass, or there's been a violation of a nun or a priest, or it's a funny thing. You know, there's a, it, it works both ways. You know, Our Lady, when she, was, when she appeared in Spain, in Garabandal, at one stage she told the children to collect everybody's rosary beads and to, uh, she blessed them. And they put them all into a basket, and she brought it to our lady, and the lady blessed them all. Then she came, the child came out and was giving back all the, the, um, those of his back to their owners. And she knew instinctively, by divine help, 
who to give the rosary to, except when she was leaving Our Lady, Our Lady said, there's a powder compact in there, don't give it to the person, because it was a pix, it was stolen and made into, if you know what a pix is, it's a little box where the priest carries the host in, that belongs to my son. So it was a sacramental that had this mark forever, that had once been used for uh, the Blessed Sacrament, um, and now had been used to turn into a, into a woman's powder compact with a little powder puff in it. So they, they, it does affect them physically. And um, I, I bet you, Bernard, if you walked into some of the areas I've had to walk into in this world, especially in, in Europe, in the Middle East, but also in America, you'd know instinctively no sacramental had ever entered. There'd never been any holiness there. And the moment you sprinkle the holy water there, the more, and prayer and pray, there's some immediate lifting of the atmosphere, I don't know what it is, or else you, you get out fast. It's, uh, the, the world is either full of God or it's full of the devil. There's no in-between. There's no neutral terrain. Let's take a look at some of the ways now that Satanism is spreading throughout uh, our society, so here in North America or in Europe. Well, we're into a new phase, uh, a completely new phase. That's our opinion in this matter. And I'll tell you why we call it a new phase. There's no doubt about it that from before the time of Christ, especially during the time of Christ, as the Gospels testify, there has always been possession. Always been possession. And always been exorcism too. The Jewish religion did give a means of exorcism to its uh, priests and wise men. Uh, and Christ himself you, you had, being Lord and Master, he could expel devils like that. And remember, he cleaned out seven devils out of Mary Magdalene. Uh, that's a lot of devils. Um, now, We've always had that. And the Middle Ages, and right down to the Renaissance, and then to the Enlightenment, as they call it, uh, this thing continued. Then, of course, belief in the devil dropped out, and belief in the church dropped out, and Christian Catholicism was limited to certain countries. And uh, then the scientists said about proving there was no such thing as the devil, no such thing as possession, therefore. So the whole idea dropped out. In the meantime, what we have found out is happening. And by the way, this rests as much on the testimony of demons which we exorcise and have to speak and say what they're doing in life because sometimes the people who need to be, come for exorcism and this I must keep my mouth shut off this, on this point are high up in government of finance and they've influenced upon a lot of people in a lot of countries and you'd be appalled sometimes by the by the near accidents we ran with great men and great women uh, but about that we can't speak an awful lot. But know that it's a fact. That, uh, because from all that testimony, from all that factual situation, as well as from what the Church tells us, it's quite clear that what Lucifer has concentrated on today is the groups, group, group organization. Um, there's no doubt about it that running right through our society, say, take my, my own country here, the USA, running right through its society, especially in the public institutions. Public institutions. And by that I mean government offices at the city, state, and federal level. Uh, Washington. There's no doubt about it that uh, Lucifer has acquired a phalanx of servitors, of servants in these places, who will do his bidding and do his bidding automatically. Some of them I've met, some of them are completely possessed. They simply they do his will of morning unto life. And they have a very good time. They have a great success. They have a very good life as far as material things go. So it's influencing groups to do his will. And to do his will in this matter means decatholicizing the church, ridding public life of any semblance of religion at all, any religion, not merely Roman Catholicism. Um, but Roman Catholicism is a special enemy because we, he knows, have something the others haven't got. And, you know, Bernard, somebody has said it, and it's true, and it's not a Catholic who said it, if tomorrow the Roman Catholic Church were wiped out completely, the rest of Christianity would fall to pieces. It's the lodestone that holds them all together, finally, and it's the norm by which they define themselves. Um, so the, 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 the mode today is different. It's no longer individuals. It's now whole groups, it's whole governments, it's whole schools, it's whole, uh, it's all, whole foundations. Uh, it's whole organization dedicated to promoting the will of Satan along the sexual line, along the art line, 
along the historic line, along the statecraft line, along the economic line, along the line of, say, um, junk bonds. It's, it's a funny thing. This is his tactic. And this means that he, in, in, his, in, his, in his plans, in Lucifer's plans, there's a showdown coming. And he's marshalling all the forces possible. Um, and he's succeeding so far. He's got so many servants because he grants them success. They get success. You see, what we are, what you and I forget is this: that when you're normally doing your work, but I'm doing my work, and we're doing it decently and as good as we can, and as sinlessly as we can, we're getting light from God continually. They call it Lumen Christi, light of Christ. We get it in our brains, our intelligence. Similarly, if I'm serving Satan, he has his own light. He will enlighten them, and they have their own intuitions, their own instructions, their own, their own light. He gives light and makes them succeed and gives them their pleasures and gives them their successes. Oh yes, oh, he's a good leader from that point of view, except that they end up finally um, burnt to a crisp <laughs> for eternity. <laughs> but uh, he does endow them with it, and that's why they're very intelligent. You can't, don't misunderstand, don't under, underestimate them. They're formidable enemies. And whether it's in the ACLU or the Planned Parenthood Federation or uh, some of the out-and-out -out, uh, homosexual organizations, which are, which even the ordinary homosexual you meet says, "My God, it's disgusting." Um, you know, he's got his servitors, and they are very faithful to him. It permeates our whole society, even in the music, for example. Oh, above all, in the music, there's nothing more influential than music. I know that. You see, but what, what is difficult for normal citizens to imagine is this. And this holds for Canada or for USA or Australia or England or Europe. It holds for those areas because that's where the Satan is most active at the present moment, according to our statistics. It's very difficult for them to realize that over a period of time, hard to calculate, but certainly in the region of about 150 years, coming to a, a culmination in the middle of our century, there has grown up an organizational institution kept very private, with membership lists, uh, with centers, with leaders, uh, with a bank balance, with funds, and with great influence, that, like an octopus, is spreading through every one of our public institutions. and. Um, whether it's the armed forces, or whether it's the federal government, say here, or the government in Canada, in uh, in Toronto, or whatever it is, um, it is there, and he's planning things. And you ca you can only account for some of the things that are happening in our world by presupposing such a thing exists. We know it exists otherwise, uh, but you'd be led to conclude there was something like that there, merely by by watching the phenomenon take place. There must be something coordinating all that because it's all moving in one direction. The Russian is terrible, Bernard. You probably are too young. I'm not putting rank on you. I'm complimenting you um, to know that you're used to change today. I mean, there's a change every week and every month. But when I was young, there was no such thing. Every decade was a tin top of the previous decade. Somebody has so arranged world affairs that now it's in flux always. We have been forced to get used, to get accustomed to change, perpetual change. That, that's not only in our politics, but in our lives. The job system today requires you to travel. You have to travel. Uh, the, the job system requires the husband to go to Seattle and the wife to stay in uh, Oklahoma, because that's the only way they can make their money work. And people change jobs every two or three years now. And they move. Or the he moves or she moves, the family stays behind. I know that's an arrangement that takes place today. That's why we have so, I think, not half our families, but it's a near one half our families are one-parent families. Um, but there's this change. And then another change which has been instituted, this will show the extent of this octopus, is this, that we have now got used to the fact that people will wear clothes, slacks, men and women, uh, and jeans, which will show all the contours of their bodies. And we have to get used to that. And the videos, the ad advertisements you see, whether you're in television over there or here, they are showing things which my grandmother and grandfather would fall to pieces over. We have become a, we, we don't we don't blink an eyelid at it any longer. A nude, a naked, a very revealing dress, 
uh, a, a male body almost showing all the, the, the relevant parts of it, we, we don't care. We, we've been made to get used to that. That's, we said that's what they do nowadays. Language, the four lettered words that are in English, you just can't afford to be shocked if you're going to listen to TV. You can't afford to be shocked because they're going to use every one of them. You have, they've made you used to it. Another effect. A third effect is that now, if you lift your eyebrows at a dinner table, certainly in America, except in very fundamentalist circles, if somebody says, well, Joe is living with Mary now for the last three years, and they're very happy, you're supposed to take that like as if Joe, if said about Joe that Joe has got a haircut. It's probably no. If he says that, well, Joe and Michael decided that they were best buddies and they could uh, give life support to each other, they love each other very much, meaning they have a homosexual union, you're supposed to, oh, really? That's, uh, that's bravo. I mean, you're not supposed to, or not, not common at all. You've got to get used to it, lad, because that's the way it is. And anybody who objects to that will immediately be ostracized. But that every day, Bernard, to, give, to, to let our listeners know, every day on the international stock market, say, of Tokyo, Singapore, Berlin, uh, Dusseldorf, Paris, Rome, uh, uh, Tokyo, London, New York, about $600 billion are sloshed around in the stock deals, perfectly legitimate. And there are hundreds of thousands of small uh, investors all over the world. But there are only about up to 100 who deal every day on those markets, on all those markets, with about 20 to $40 billion. They, they know what's going on. They decide who lives and who dies. They govern money. They govern the flow of capital and capital goods to each country without which a country dies on a daily basis. They decide, and they are, we are convinced, firmly in the camp of, uh, of Lucifer. They serve his purpose to create a world without God and a world which is inhuman in our sense of the word. They um, have a lot of power. And unfortunately, they're going to try and... We, when we spoke a moment ago about the changes imposed, imposed on us, in our eating, in our clothes, in the way we, the, what we hear on television, or we hear on radio, or we hear in, in films, and uh, what we hear in, uh, in drama. Um, we're talking about that. Remember those changes that were forced on us, and the clothes they were forcing on us? Uh, all those things are planned, because that's where the intelligence is, and it is definitely satanic. It's to wipe out Christian civilization. The devil has very little time to do it, and he has almost succeeded. So Christianity is going to have no role in this New World Order? None. None. Paul VI, even poor Paul VI, who died in 1978, said that probably the Church will be reduced to an infinitesimally small part of humanity. No influence whatever. Everybody would have walked over it, like countries, like armies, walked over Belgium in history and left it flat. Uh, they've, they've walked over the, 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 this whole the, the, uh, society that we created for exorcism, they've walked over it, they simply walked beyond it. And uh, there are several organizations that have failed to, because um, we're not able to manage it. We're not able to manage it. These people are too powerful. This is the end of tape number one. The discussion will continue on tape number two. Does the struggle between good and evil enter into the church directly? Can Satan have an influence even inside the church? From our experience, we have to say yes to that question. It's a difficult question to answer theoretically. Not that we don't know the theoretic principles behind Satan's penetration. You see, Satan is free to penetrate everywhere that human beings exercise free will. The book of Job has the, has the classic example of that. At the beginning of the book of Job, Satan is confronted by God and he says, God says to him, look at my servant Job just a man you cannot find in the land. And Satan says to uh, God in the story, which is only a story from that point of view, give me my chance, I will make him fall. And God says something like the equivalent of, it's a free country. If you can make him fall, take him as your prey. And the principle is that anyone who is human, who has a free will, is liable. Now, that's uh, all the apostles and all the bishops and all the priests and all the popes are free agents so they can be tempted. Secondly, there's this, that, um, you know, Christ speaking to the apostles on the Lake of Galilee after his resurrection said to them all, Satan has wanted to sieve you all like a man sieves wheat and chaff. And then turning to Peter he says, and you especially, 
So he, he told them they'd be tempted. And uh, the history of the church, or of church men as such, tells us that temptation and uh, giving way to temptation has been the law of churchmen from the very beginning. Even Peter himself yielded to fear, which was a temptation, and denied his Lord three times. And uh, so there's no doubt about it, Satan can penetrate the church. What we must emphasize today, though, Bernard, is that the ordinary penetration of the church through its members by Satan has been demonstrated amply in the past. What we have never found in the history of the church since the ascension of our Lord, and that was when the church was really set up, the Pentecost and the ascension, is that this is the first time we have undeniable proof that Satan has been enthroned in the church by some of the church's own churchmen and that the citadel which before was besieged with small breaches in it and small little traitors now has Satan enthroned within it and you know Paul VI who ended up a very miserable Pope although he did his best in the end of his life he gave an interview to his great French friend Jean Guiton who later published it when he died and at one stage Jean Guiton said to him Holiness um, Saint-Pete, what do you think is the fate of the church going to be? You have said that the smoke of Satan has in the church and is wafting around the sanctuary altar. And uh, Paul VI said, yes, he said, mon fils, my son, we have said that and it is true. The smoke of Satan is in the sanctuary. And probably Catholics are, just, uh, are uh, destined to become an infinitesimally small part of humanity due to the presence of Satan. Uh, and that means that in the mind of Paul VI, because they went on talking, Catholicism and Catholics and the Church will be marginalized completely because their, 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 their impressive leaders would be taken over by the temptations of the devil. And what we must remember is this, that sure, there have always been temptations in the Church for churchmen, for gold, for sensuality, for pride and ambition. But this is the first time that a new assault has been lodged. The assault is very simple. Just be like the rest of men. Adore a general God, be good, be compassionate men, be humanitarian, join man in building man's earthly world, earthly, uh, earthly uh, habitation in this world. And this is the first time this has cottoned on. And I must tell you that there's a bland note in documents coming out from bishops the least you can say about them uh, is that and from Rome to a certain human gallantry a certain romanticism that has nothing to do with salvation it is let's share with humanity my humanity's labors let's join with man in helping man to solve his problems the church's aim is not to solve economic problems of man or political problems the only victory the church has and the only victory Christ promised to the church was when any man dies or any woman dies they don't go to hell they either go to purgatory or heaven because the church has conveyed Christ's grace to them. It is undeniable that today the um, Satan has entered the church in a very positive way. Um, the, if you ask me further details on that, I must confess to you, Bernard, that I do not intend, uh, from where I sit, with my responsibilities, I do not intend to burden the imagination and the memory of your listeners with the details. But I must say this much, that Satan has been welcomed, Lucifer, the enemy of Christ, the tempter of Adam and Eve, he who hates Our Lady, he whose head she has crushed and will crush, he who finally will be blown away by the breath of Christ's mouth in the last day, who is responsible for all souls who went to hell, he has been successfully received and enthroned within the citadel. We are now not looking out at the enemy. The enemy is among us. And your book, The Keys of This Blood, indicated that within Rome itself there exists a super force that has paralyzed the governing machinery of the church, even That's in the right. Vatican. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. There is this force which uh, is at the present moment un, 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 un irremovable. I was going to say undislodgeable, but irremovable is a better English word. And 
this is where again one's faith in Our Lady of Fatima comes in because she said so and she said that only I can save the church because that is what my son has willed not because of her own choice but because that, that's what Christ has chosen that she shall be the one to come finally and save the church before the final disaster because if you read carefully what Our Lady told Lucia you get the strong picture that things are going to get so bad so many of the elect will lose their faith so many people who now believe will finally give up in despair and commit suicide or be taken away by Satan as his prey so much so that if she did not step in nobody would be saved and it reminds us of that awful phrase the gentle Christ used once when he's speaking to the apostles they must have fallen out of their pants when they heard him say when the Son of Man comes back to earth he was talking about his resurrection and his disappearance and then he's coming back in the last day when I come back am I going to find any faith on earth? you know Bernard that frightens me because I consider myself to be strong in faith and I now see that Christ will envisage in that sentence that I who think I'm strong in faith I might be dislodged and that frightens my soul because I want to go to heaven I don't want to go to hell I don't want to burn forever number one and number two I want to be in possession of eternal beauty and truth forever because that's my being was made for that I don't want to become the devil's booty the devil's prey so the danger is that today because the magisterium has a muffled voice the office still exists it is a muffled voice, an uncertain voice. The churchmen who are supposed to voice the magisterium have uncertain voices. They're affected in their faith. They're affected in their outlook. They're affected in their performance through fear and through what Our Lady called disequilibrium of mind. She said to Lucia once, my child, don't be surprised if the best minds suffer from an imbalance at a certain moment. Wonk and waver. And um, because that is so, there's a great crisis of faith in the church. And there's no there's no point of recall, there's no rappel to order, there's no leading voice really talking in the church today, inspiring us all, it isn't there. So we're under siege, very badly. And um, I'm not a pessimist or an optimist, I'm a realist. And if I look at the question of seminaries, if I look at the question of bishops, if I look at the question of the nuns, if I look at the question of theologians, Bernard, there's no light at the end of the tunnel yet. We're in the tunnel, and we're going to be in it for quite a while. There's no salvation coming so far. We've just got to weather this as best we can and keep our faith. And you know the extraordinary phenomenon today is this, that when I was young, for instance, I'm 70, remember that, even if you were inclined to wonky and to waver and to divigate from the, the straight and narrow path, there was a community to support you. Your family, the, even the local cop, the local teacher, the schools, the library, your friends the families, uh, celebrations locally. There was a community. Today, there is no Catholic community. Anywhere. You have groups of one and two and three and ten. There's me on you and you on me, and we are our friends together. And there's other groups that meet and we... we it, it's one on one today. Small communities. There's no such thing as a unified parish. There is, I probably, in the whole of the... Uh, of, uh, of America, I suppose, there are about ten parishes that I know of, certainly, who are really united parish, but it's an extraordinary priest there, an extraordinary uh, parish priest in every one of those. And when he dies, the bishop is going to strip it. He has said so, because he dislikes all tradition. He wants it to be modern. So we have this condition today that we're all separated and broken up in small little bits. And that's what Christ has willed as our crucifixion. I always remind people, though, that when we say that, what we should remember is this, that all the fathers agree that the history of the church will reproduce exactly the history of Christ. And as far as I can see, if you want to draw a picture, a word picture of today, according to the image of Christ and his passion, you should say that, um, well, we have the crown of thorns, certainly, because we have the, those theologians on top of our back, Richard McCormick down here, and, and Gandon up in uh, Canada, and uh, people all over the place, and they're sticking thorns into our head, and they're shaming us, and, uh, and they're torturing us, and we're being scourged at the pillar, yeah. We're being scourged because of our disgraceful behavior. Our pedophiliac priests and our Gucci nuns uh, and our apostate bishops, and I could name off several uh, dioceses in this country, of ours like, for instance, uh, the Diocese of Albany, I consider it to be an apostate bishop. And uh, 
the Diocese of Milwaukee with Bishop Weekland, uh, Archbishop Weekland, and the others, and it's, it's, I think they probably themselves would agree to it. But this is all scourging of our public body. Um, but we haven't yet started going to Calvary, carrying our cross, and we haven't reached Calvary, nor have we been crucified. Look at the lovely time that's ahead of us, Bernard, if we're going to follow that pattern of our Lord's sufferings. That we, means that there's going to be a resurrection. Of course there's going to be a resurrection, and we will be resurrected. Um, and we'll be resurrected in glory, but after our crucifixion and death, and we have to suffer that, I'm afraid. Um, and once that is over, once Our Lady uh, comes on her appointed time, giving us the signal that she has promised to give us, then we can lift our faces to the east, because it's from the east our salvation will come. <clears throat> that, uh, that's in brief how, the, that is how Satan is working at the present moment. And uh, there is no gainsaying his power uh, in the church uh, on account of the unfaith he has sown. He has so many supporters within the church now. And let's take a look at the manifestations of this support that Satan has within the church. Let's say uh, heresies like uh, liberation theology or this new age philosophy. Yeah. Could you maybe describe briefly some of the worst ones? Well, I'll tell you, you've named, you named two principal ones. Liberation theology, of course, was, as you know, concocted with one deliberate reason in mind. In the 50s they did this. Sat down carefully in Panama City, a group of people, Catholic theologians and Marxists, and they worked out the following, that there was no way you could touch the Catholicism directly of Latin American peoples. There was just their culture, their very names, their salutations, their, the names of the weak, their, everything they did, even when they cursed, uh, it, it implied religion. So they said, why don't we use Catholic terminology in a Marxist sense, but still using it? So they set out to speak about La Virgen, the Virgin, who is the mother of revolutionaries, Madre de la Revolución, and speak about Christ the bread of the workers, but when they said El Pan de los Trabajadores, they meant Christ, the bread of the workers, which we make in our factory, we've taken from the capitalists, and so on. They, they Marxized every uh, 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 Christian concept, or they Christianized every Marxist concept. And it was a very subtle thing, because it wiped out, there was no such thing as per, uh, personal sin. The only sin they wanted to liberate themselves from, um, for them, them, themselves from was capitalism, Yankee capitalism. That was the enemy. But liberation didn't mean any liberation from sin by the blood of Christ. That didn't matter. And you know, at the famous meeting of the liberation theologians in Brazil in 1987, with 12 bishops and I don't know how many priests and how much lay people, everybody went and trod on the crucifix. Because they said the crucifix and the passion of Jesus, this enervates our fighting revolutionary power. And they have started off on that line. Now, Unfortunately, see, liberation theology has fallen very evil days because Moscow has ceased to support them. And the great uh, vindicator and champion of liberation theology in, in this part of the world, Mr. Castro, is sinking beneath the waves with a stiff upper lip. And he's on his way out slowly. So they have, but has created terrible damage because while it's now seeping out of Latin America slowly, it's not out of it yet, it's still ensconced in North America in the seminaries and in England, where they're all liberation theologians. And you dare speak to them about going to confession, they say, for what? There's no such thing as personal sin. Sin is social sin, sinful structure, sinful governments. And we're not sinful governments, just the government we have is. So that's one great sin, one great heresy, and it's still there and it's troubled to the church. The second one is more pervasive, and it's the New Age. Bernard, you've heard about political correctness. It's the rage now in New York in Los Angeles, in California, in down south, in Dallas and Fort Worth, all over the United States, in our courts, in our newspapers. There are certain things you cannot say, otherwise you are not politically correct and socially acceptable. You cannot, for instance, be openly uh, advocating, um, uh, openly advocating, for instance, uh, celibacy. Oh, you don't do that. That's medieval and it's superstitious and it produces all these pedophiliac priests. And that's the argument against it. Uh, priests should marry and uh, have the option at least to be able to marry and therefore to get rid of their, their bad instincts. They wouldn't become deviants. Another thing political correctness forbids is um, any attack on homosexuality as a sin. It's not. It's an alternative way of life. 
uh, any attack on abortion. No, it's a, it's a legitimate constitutional right of every uh, red-blooded American man and woman to have an abortion or to procure an abortion. Uh, the new world is built on one principle. The new world is built on the principle that man, if left alone by religion and religionists and hierarchic authorities, is able to build a paradise on earth. And you want to worship the Virgin? Fine worship her, but worship her with us. Let us all share it and be sane, have an even plain surface during which we, on which we can all worship as we want to worship, but leave the other alone. Don't say he's wrong. He's just as white as you, and you're just as white as him. This is the new age. Of course, we will have to worship one father, because we, there's only one God, you Christians say, you Catholics say. We agree to that. But it's the father of the earth. It's the father of fruit and flowers, father of lambs, father of uh, fruitful gardens and trees and meadows, and a fa a fa a father for all our agriculture, father for our technology. That's real God, because that helps man. It's no longer uh, a dominant hierarchic exclusivist, paternalistic, patriarchal church demanding sacrifices and waiting for pie in the sky. There's no pie in the sky. The pie is here. And there's enough for everybody if you Catholics and religions will stop being exclusivist and join in. That's the new age. And the new age is more subtle than anything else because I'll tell you why. The essence of the new age technique now being taught to companies and to company executives is self-control. And the exercises of the New Age being used in seminars, paid for, for thousands of dollars by big companies like GM and uh, several other big companies in the United States, consists in submitting your mind to a discipline. And when we examine that discipline from our point of view here, we find out that discipline is almost the same as TM. It does the very same silencing of your faculties and leaves you wide open to any influence that will come in. Now I'll tell you one thing. Whatever other influences are out there looking for a uh, point of entry, there's one, in, uh, one influence roaming around like a lion seeking whom he may devour, and that is Lucifer. And if you adopt this, uh, the mental attitude that they are trying to inculcate the new agers, as they call them, you'll find that you are sitting duck for the most amazing row of influences. And we think that it's partly the rise of the new age system uh, of egalitarian treatment of all religions and the submission of the mind and the opening up of the spirit to the, the great force, we have found that the rise of that is coetaneous, is, is, is simultaneous with the rise of this intense diabolism, intense Satanism. So there must, there must be some organic connection between the two. We're persuaded that there is a connection between the two. Uh, the New Age is pernicious because See, it's, it's good, it's compassionate. It says don't kill, don't steal, don't kill little children, don't conceive them either. But th that's the most merciful way of not doing things. And don't overpopulate the world, and um, don't make war. No, make love. Uh, and uh, join in the technological and industrial advancement of all peoples. And don't see black or white or sky blue pink. Color doesn't matter. Um, so it sounds very democratic, it sounds very compassionate, it sounds very human. The other thing is that Christianity, the message of Christ, is not democratic, it's not human, it's supernatural, um, and it's meant to prepare us for eternity. So the New Age is the subtlest attack on the Church. It has invaded the Church. And um, the amount of uh, Catholics who now become Freemasons, say, or join organizations that are very anti-Catholic, is due to the fact that the leavening of this New Age mentality who said that haven't we been fighting long enough with each other? Why can't we sit down and practice love and agree with people and agree to build with them? What's wrong with that? And if I have a cathedral in Pittsburgh and you have no cathedral and you're a Methodist or a Lutheran, well, have my cathedral because we're all worshipping the same God. And so the mixture and the, the syncretism of all religions start and you find you find a mixture, say you find a, a meeting in Detroit of the local uh, chapter of the, an international Jewish organization meeting in unison with the, the confraternity of the Sacred Heart and the, Jewish, uh, the, and the Masonic Lodge. All perfectly good brothers in the Lord and sisters in the Lord. So they have sort of an amalgam and they all feel good about it. And, the, the, the Catholics worship Christ and the Jews worship uh, uh, God and the, the, the Masons have their own uh, version of God but we're all human 
So it's, and it leaves you in peace. And there's cooperation, financial, social, political, and there's peace. Isn't that what we're all supposed to do, Bernard? So it's a very tempting thing. Instead of some fiery pope or some fiery theologian or some subtle uh, preacher saying, no, 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 there's a basic truth. Outside the church, there's no salvation. You can't be a good anything but a good Catholic if you want to be saved. One way or the other, you have to get grace through Christ, through the church. That's unacceptable. Politically incorrect and socially unacceptable today. So that's the great uh, crisis in the church from the point of view of faith. The crisis undermining the church from another side is the crisis of the papacy. Now related to the a New Age philosophy, of course, is the feminist ideology which has per also pervaded the church recently. It has. Feminism is a, is a new sort of a, not a heresy. It's, it's not a heresy because they haven't been able to work out, despite their best efforts, and there's a flood of books for the last five, seven years. I, I stopped buying the books finally because it's an outstanding book, outstanding in venom or outstanding in historical research. But the flood of uh, documents uh, supporting feminism and pushing it is so great that you, can, you can't speak about it as a heresy because they have not found a theological framework to justify their claims. But what they have is an intense emotion and passion. And it's a very funny thing, though, that when you come to talk to feminists and frequent their organizations and frequent their circles and their study groups, you always find two things coming immediately. You find that as they progress in their feminism, their feminist passion and their feminist emotion and feminist enthusiasm, they always end up with some form of Wicca. And Wicca is uh, the old, old witchcraft wherein the goddess Gaia and Sophia are worshipped and in which uh, lesbian love is blessed and in which the earth is venerated as divine and in which no mention of the son or the father are allowed. It's the mother and the daughter. In other words, feminism, theologically speaking, this is why they find it difficult to formulate an acceptable theology because people are still inclined to have traditional ideas, is this. Feminism aims directly at the heart of the Trinity. Like homosexuality, it wants to wipe out the idea of fatherhood and sonhood and daughterhood. It wants to have womanhood. And that's where they speak about woman church. Just that's the whole thing, womanhood and woman church. That's all there is. The rest is accretion, cultural accretion, and religious, uh, uh, religious burdens taken over from patriarchal men and churchmen. Um, it is, I suppose, if you were to ask me what is the most blasphemous form of, aside of Satan's attack on society, it is his sowing of feminism. It's a direct insult to Our Lady. She is the Queen of Heaven and the Mother of all the living. She is the example of purity, chastity, motherhood, daughterhood. She's daughter of the Most High. She's mother of the Most High. And she's also the model of the wife. She was a real wife, a real spouse of St. Joseph. That's all attacked. Spouse, marriage, that's nothing to do with feminism, whatever. Women must be liberated from that. And lesbian love does liberate them from that. So it's an attack on the family? Ultimately on the Trinity. Because through the family they hope to attack the Trinity. Because if the family is wiped out in human society, the Trinity ceases to exist. It's... The ultimate aim is the Trinity, and that is Satan's hatred of that Trinity of divine persons that said, be damned, go to hell. And that's his weapon against it. And if he can destroy that, once you wipe out the Trinity, once you wipe out the whole idea of fatherhood and sonhood and daughterhood, and destroy the family, then there is no longer a divine family, there's no longer a human family, there's nothing but chaos. And uh, that is the, uh, that's the, in the social order, that's the most blasphemous success and effort that Satan has put through. The shame, the shame is this. The shame and the pity of women is this. Negatively speaking, the shame is this. Since women have got so far in entering the, what they call the patriarchal society, society hasn't got more merciful. The pilots, women pilots of helicopters and gunships, who went to the Gulf were just as bloody-minded as the men. 
And we know that female executives in firms are the worst, the hardest to take. Men say, no, give me a, a crotchety old man any time you like. Give me the biggest son of a gun you can find, but not a woman. Cruel and merciless beyond belief once they depart from their role as women. That's the negative side of the shame. The positive side of the shame is that being called by the very fact of being a woman, being called to be a replica of Our Lady, her beauty, her motherhood, her virginity, her purity, her daughterhood, and her closeness to God. And how closer can a human person be than by being, having eternity in your womb? And your model being the mother of God, personal model. Uh, such an honor conferred on any woman who wants to imitate it, and they have rejected it. It's the shame of feminism, uh, and it, it, it makes one cry at the, the, the lack of wisdom, the lack of perception, and also the hatred Satan has. He remembers one day in the garden when he was told, wait for her, for her heel. She's going to walk on your head. She's going to walk on your head. You're going to be crushed by a woman. And her seed will be your undo. So he hates that. that, that. You know, there's, a, there's one scene when Bernadette, Marie Bernadette Subi, who was having the first visions of Our Lady and Louis. Remember that scene, the first, the third time? She came down, she found the lady standing there with yellow roses in her, you know, in her feet and a yellow sash in this marvelous face. And she was smiling. He was smiling. And she had this strange joy. And when Bernadette said, to Who are you? She had this extraordinary joy and she said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Said it in Bernadette's dialect. And then, but the first day Bernadette went down, she didn't know what to do. And she had an apron and she always kept her rosary beads in the apron. She got her rosary beads because she thought it was the devil. And started saying, The Our Father. And she saw a lady take her own rosary beads from her sash and say, The Our Father. Silently. And then she went to the first Hail Mary and she saw Mary's fingers moving to the, the first bead. And so she went to the whole deck and then she suddenly realized that it wasn't the devil. The devil wouldn't say the rosary. She progressed in talking at the second or third day. And then the, the word spread around the local peasantry to which she belonged, she was a peasant girl, that she was talking to the La Vierge. So they all, all the peasants came down beside her and they used to pass notes over to her and whisper, say, ask Our Lady to cure my calf. Uh, ask Our Lady to bring my husband back from Paris. Request them. And Our Lady was laughing at them pleasantly and saying, yes, I will, no, I can't, etc. And at a certain stage, in the middle of this, when they could only hear Bernadette's voice giving the messages and getting the answers from this virgin they couldn't see, in another of the caves, because this place was lined with grottoes and caves, they heard the dirtiest, most threatening, smelling voice of about a thousand lions hungry for flesh. It was obviously Satan's disruption of the scene. And everybody hushed. There wasn't a sound when they heard this, like wild animals waiting to tear you limb from limb. And Bernadette sort of appealed to Our Lady. And all Our Lady did, she didn't say a word, she just turned her head and looked at the mouth of the cave and Psh! silence, silence. That's Our Lady's power. And if they only realize that's, that's what they can inherit as women. If they want to change society, they want to cure men's uh, chauvinism, she's the one who can do it. If they turn to her, you know, they want to make the humanist more compassionate. She's the mother of all compassion. But what a shame they missed that opportunity, missed their vocation, missed their vocation. And they're killing the fruit of their own womb. What are they going to say to Our Lady when she said, I was a mother too. And you were a mother and you killed your baby? You killed three babies? And here they are looking at you. What, what does a woman say when she faces that accusation? What depth of hell is deep enough to hide you? Where can you hide from your shame? In our discussion uh, earlier, you just touched on the subject of Satan's assault on the papacy. Perhaps we could have a brief discussion about that. But if we didn't speak about the papacy before the end of this uh, conversation, I know that by the autumn of 1992, this year, you certainly would be very angry and disappointed with me. By the spring of 93 and well into May, June and July of that year, I don't think you would ever speak to me again because I would have let you down. I wouldn't have brought to your notice what I think is fatally necessary for every Catholic to know and that is the fate 
of the papacy and the coming stress and danger and that we shall be without the strength of the papacy. Now let me explain what I'm talking about. There would be no difficulty in the eyes of the church's enemies, both the seeker organizations, the one to take a hold of the church, and in the eyes of all the dissident theologians, there would be no difficulty in being Catholic if the papacy ceased to be an active, influential and jurisdictional element authoritative or authoritative element. If the Pope or whoever is supposed to be the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, were just one amongst his peers, a fellow bishop, prominent because he is the most ancient chancellor in the most ancient church, and St. Peter after all was in Rome, and Paul was in Rome, and Rome has always been the center, but that's all. If that was all, it was a question of honor and veneration, and the man behaved himself like one of us, as a, a peer amongst his peers, there would be no difficulty, nor would the secret enemies of the church have ever sought to possess the Rome, to enter into it, and nor would Satan ever have wafted his smoke in there. It's a waste of time otherwise. The prize, the prize, the booty, to be taken away and devoured is the papacy. Now, we want to be very clear what we mean by papacy. We do not mean the tiara, the triple crown. We do not mean the gold of the Vatican Museums. We don't mean the papal thrones. We don't mean anything grandiose and valuable from the point of view of riches or prestige or influence. We just mean one thing, and that the papacy implies that there is one individual, a man, on the face of the earth, who claims and can back up that claim with historical proof and the weight of divine faith. That he, and he alone, in a population of six billion, is the only one who can speak about God authoritatively to any man alive. He is the only one who claims it and the only one who can back it up. And he is the only one who, first of all, backs it up by proving that he is the uh, one of 264 men going back link by link through bad, good and indifferent, saint and sinner, the bishops of Rome, back to the first bishop of Rome who was told by Jesus, whoever listens to you listens to me. Thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. Whatever you lose here on earth will be loose in heaven. Whatever is tied up here, it will be tied up in heaven. Because the gates of hell will never prevail against you. And he has that direct historical connection. It is the pain of the Protestants who started in the 16th century, or the Unitarians who started later, or the Methodists, to find that they are uh, woebegone waifs of the centuries that started up like abortions and have no direct historical connection with the historic Jesus of history and the first men who came out with the faith and the Pentecostal tradition and revelation he gave them. Now that's the papacy. It means that one thing essential, there's one man who must be listened to under certain conditions, who is the only one who can claim that legitimately, and despite all his sins, if he does commit sin, despite all his errors, if he does commit errors, despite his bad leadership, his weakness, his unfaith, if he has all those things, he must still be listened to once he speaks dogmatically for the whole of the human race on faith and morals. That's a huge claim, because it means that literally tomorrow, the U.S. Congress should invite him over, tell them what to do about morality and dogma. It means the Houses of Parliament in England. It means every Parliament should have his delegate telling them what is human morality and religion to be. It will not be like that easy, easily. It will not happen like that. The world has rejected the idea. But that's what it implies. And by, it is not strange, by the way, that the enemies of the Church, those who dislike us, for one reason or another, justified or unjustified, know that. They know that ultimately that is his claim. And that is the message of the keys of this blood, my last book. And that those keys, you know, the scene which we probably know very well of Catherine Siena with the vision she had of the keys of Peter dipped in blood. And uh, God the Father said to her, Catherine, who's, uh, which of those keys? And she said, those are the keys you gave to Peter. And he said, yes. And why are they covered with blood? And she asked him, he said, because they will never cease to be durable. They will last forever and they will never break. And that's why the keys of this blood, the message is that this one man, this Polish Archbishop, this Cardinal, Karl Wojtyla, who does not sit well with the majority of the 3,000 bishops of this 
of this beloved church of ours and who is hated by so many nuns and so many priests and so many lay people and disliked by so many secular governments, this man is the only man on the face of the earth whom you can in any way trustingly believe is the voice of Christ. That's a huge faith. Now, that's a stumbling block for the world and it's absolute folly for most of our modern society. It's a stumbling block for them because they know that despite all the denigration they've done of the papacy, and despite the mistakes of the papacy, because the papacy has made terrible mistakes in the last hundred years, terrible mistakes. In the last two hundred years, fatal mistakes. Despite that, the prestige, the power and the influence and the peculiar moral suasion this Pope has and the papacy has, once he exercises it, miracles happen. Now, the miracles that don't want to happen are those that impede the creation of a one world government, that impede the homogenization of all education, that impede the imposition of population control, in the real sense of the word population control, because I want to speak to you about that word in a moment, because that term means much more than babies, or limitation of uh, births. But what they hate about it is this, that that, that papacy is the biggest obstacle to that because they know that if he were to act in full flush of his power and jurisdiction and authority, he could overturn them. And they've seen this so near them in their own time. They know, don't, you know, who has it said, the key monge pape meurt, uh, whoever strikes the Pope dies. It was somebody who struck the Pope, Napoleon. And he, on Helena he's supposed to have said, when somebody asked him, uh, uh, Emperor, what really happened? He said, I struck the Pope. Whoever strikes the Pope dies. I didn't know it. And to give him his due Mussolini, when he, in the early days when he was against Hitler, and Hitler was striking the church in Germany, said, whoever strikes the church, the Pope dies. <laughs> Benito even recognized that. Then he proceeded to strike the Pope, and he died. And the Pope remained. Uh, you know the old story about how many divisions the Pope has, Joseph Stalin. Same thing. They know there's this inherent past. They don't want to stir it up. They just want the papacy to go away. Now, if they can do that, we have no longer got Peter. That's not enough. Because there have been periods in the church when we haven't got a pope for ten years, for three years, for one whole year. Several times when they couldn't elect the pope, there was too much jealousy and bickering amongst the sacred cardinal electors or because the church was disrupted and there were wars on, they couldn't, the electors couldn't get together in one place. So the existence of an actual pope doesn't destroy the papacy. It's the institution. Now, to give you an example of their mind, the ideal mind. When John the Twenty-Third was pope, he was carried around on a thing called the Sedia Gestatoria. It was a platform actually made of silver, beautiful thing, but you can see it today and was carried by nine lusty men on either side. All the same height, exactly the same height, dressed in beautiful hose and special coifs for their hair and they had shoulder pads. They were trained to move so there was no jogging. The Pope was carried along and the first time I saw a Pope was in 1938 and I saw Pius XII carried, uh, 1939, I saw Pius carried into St. Peter's and I started crying when I saw this. It's sight. And when he stood and especially when he got down on that and was on his throne were also in this, they had two Flambeau, they called it French, two fans made of ostrich feathers encased in silver casings. It must have cost a fortune in silver. It was South American silver, just beautiful silver. And it was a gift, and studded with precious, studded with precious stones and gems and opals and emeralds. It hasn't been used since the time John the John the uh, John Paul I was the last one to use it, and then to put aside. John Paul II has never used it. Where is it now? It's in the Bizarre Museum. It's a relic. Will it ever be used again? God knows. I doubt it. What will happen is it will remain there for a couple hundred years, perhaps a thousand years if the church lasts, if the world lasts a thousand years, as a relic of a very ancient and beautiful custom, now quaint and utterly impractical. That is the status to which they wish to reduce the papacy. Both our enemies and the theologians and the apostate bishops. A nice relic, venerable, intensely valuable, intensely venerable because Peter, because of Paul, because of Innocent III, because of Gregory the Great, 
because of Leo the Great, because of the great man, what it did in the past. But that's all over. It's now a relic like the Scabella, the Sedia Gestatoria in the museum. Let's admire it, let's study the stones, and wonder at the primitive minds and the quaint uh, mentality of those who could use such a thing or have such a thing. That's the state they want for the Pope. So that the so that the uh, the whole idea of papacy and Christ-like jurisdiction fades out, fades out. Now, that is their aim. If they can do that by hook or by crook, then there is no longer a papacy. And you know, Christ said the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. If that were to happen, it is the end. It is the end. Is it ever possible that the cardinals at a future conclave could elect a heretical pope? You know, they have elected men in the past who had heretical ideas, two or three. They have never elected yet an apostate. An apostate. Because, uh, after all, <laughs> Origen was, her was heretical in those days, and still he's regarded almost with the state of the father of the church. And Pope Liberius, you know, had some very funny ideas about the, the status of Christ's will. He wasn't an apostate. An apostate has rebelled against the very fundamental of faith and rejected God and Christ. It, we have apostates now who are papabili. Yes, we could have an apostate. But in that day, and then we are into something terrible. We're into something which, Bernard, is something that, if you think on it in full knowledge of the meaning of your terms, is nightmarish. It would test the faith of St. Catherine of Siena, it would test the faith of the greatest saint, it would try the patience of Job, it would be a dead black day, a day on which you can close every window in black and put out the lights and dress in sackcloth and ashes and pray that you're spared because your faith is going to be battered to pieces if that happens. Because then they have the prize and everything goes underground. And we are indeed on our way to becoming what Paul VI in his misery called in 1978 an infinitesimally small part of humanity, completely marginalized and pushed to the side and forgotten as a quaint group of people as interesting as Tibetan astrologers on a modern campus. Let's now take a bit of a look at the whole concept of an underground church because I think uh, to a certain extent, let's say in the United States and Canada, and uh, Europe, we do have a situation where we have an underground church that exists. I'm glad you said that, Bernard, because I was going to say, if you hadn't made that added on that right, I would have said to you, listen, we needn't look for a concept, we have it. You see, there's a basic thing, I think, which I must insist on saying to you, Bernard, and be patient with me now for one moment. Anybody looking at the church today can see in the facade, in the, in the, in the appearance, all the elements that were there in 1950. Pope, bishops, cardinals, priests, nuns, newspapers, seminaries, Darson newspapers, institutes, public publishing houses, uh, missions, orders, religious orders of nuns and priests. Um, the facade is there. The terrible thing is, what most people cannot allow themselves to admit, is that it is an illusion. The organization as it was then does not exist now. There's an illusion. The institutional organization that functioned then, that kept the Pope coagulated with the bishops, the bishops with the priests, the priests with the nuns and the people, and a, a whole flow of obedience and command flowing up and down, carefully nourished in doctrine and discipline and rule and punishment for infraction of rules, and kept the cohesion tight, is gone. It doesn't exist. There are no ten bishops that agree on anything. There are no two hundred priests that agree on anything. There is no cohesion about the real presence of the Blessed Sacrament, about devotion to Our Lady, about the value of celibacy, about the value of purity, about the value of marriage, about the value of human life. We're riven with it. And our people, 77% of American Roman Catholics practice, uh, practice uh, um, contraception. 52% believe in abortion as a choice. Homosexuality is accepted by 46%. What is this? And we're just half, barely half, going to Mass and Communion enough to satisfy their obligations? 
it's not as bad as Austria, where it's five percent, but it's pretty bad. Um, and we have life homosexuality in, in the in the in the seminaries run by the bishops, and we have heritage teaching in the seminaries run by bishops. Come on, the church doesn't exist, and Rome can't do anything about it. Doctor, Mr. Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger knew nothing about it. The Pope can't do anything about it. They know it all. And when we find that there's a, a ring of priests in the Archdiocese of, of Chicago, which has been practicing satanic pedophilia amongst themselves and killing any dissident member of their own group for how many years past, and nobody's done anything about it, and they've known about it? Facade. Of course it's a facade. The church doesn't exist as it did exist. The church organization. What you and I must remember is that our pride is that we belong to a corporate body called the mystical body of Jesus, which is real, as real as the nose in your face, but it's spiritual. It means that once you're in the state of grace, whether you're here on earth, or in purgatory, or in heaven, you form one mystical body of grace and happiness in Trinitarian subsistence. That we do belong to. The visible organization which started off with Peter and James and John running helter-skelter to avoid Jewish persecution and go to the Gentiles and being thrown off walls and drowned in the rivers and given over to animals to be eaten and run through with, spe with spears and crucified upside down. All that, that was the visible church then. This, what we saw in the 1950s, didn't exist then. It wasn't necessary. It isn't necessary now. And God is letting it be taken away from us. So we have a facade of a church which isn't the organizational institution of the church proper. And then we have the underground church. And that's composed of a minority of Catholics today. A minority certainly in the United States. A minority in Canada and Australia and New Zealand and in Europe. And a minority over in Africa and Asia. It's a minority. It's underground because the authorities want to get rid of it. They want to persecute them. They want to push them out. The priests, they try to defrock them, try to let them hang in the wind slowly, or convert and be nice conciliar Catholics. Uh, the marriages, they have so bastardized with their annulments that now we speak about Catholic divorce. Because the annulment they give, most of them are not Real, uh, divorce, uh, real annulments, they're real divorces, but they're being easy and making it easy for people. And we have the toleration of homosexuality, and we have the toleration of uh, various other things that utterly are in, 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 incompatible. So many people said, this is bad. I'm going to organize my small group with my wife, my, my husband, my children, my friends. We're going to have a priest comes privately, says Mass for us, gives us Holy Communion. If we can't have that, we're going to have Holy Communion in the basement in a tabernacle. And we will distribute it ourselves. And there'll be a wider priest comes around every so often, instructs the children, and distributes Holy Communion. Here's confessions. That's what happened. So we now have a full-blown underground church, which doesn't call itself that, which uh, is deliberately not sticking its nose above ground, which is staying away from controversy, but creating its own ambient and its own congregations. And uh, the bishops don't know that, and the authorities don't seem to care. Some of them don't even know what it means, because they think that once they have the facade, and once they have the money coming in and the properties, that they have the church. They, they have lost their faith. They don't know what's going on. And now, that is the condition of the church. There is an underground church, and it's going to be bigger. Unfortunately, it is being ravaged by cults. Because as you know, we have a plethora of seers and visionaries and people coming along with what Our Lady said to them last night and what Our Lord told them yesterday and very long speeches Our Lord and Our Lady make to them. Uh, and we died and think Our Lord had so many words or Our Lady said so many words. But this is creating devastation because cults introduce divisiveness. And some of them claim to be the cult, the proper way, and others just claim that they're all equal. So it's, it's divisiveness. It's Satan again trying to follow it all. Um, there is an underground church. That's the conclusion. Is it uh, justified under these circumstances? Absolutely. If the only way that you can have your children go to confession and Holy Communion and you can hear a Mass at least once a month and receive the body and blood of Christ truly once a month, there is no question in my mind. Because without that, you're not going to save your soul. You won't have sanctifying grace. You'll slip. You'll, you'll break up, um, and so it's necessary. Now, let's take a look at another question. Suppose there is a dissident uh, theologian mm. or an apostate bishop. Uh, Are they part of the mystical body of Christ or not? No, no, no. An apostate has ceased to be. That's why no apostate bishop can receive obedience. You, you're free from all obedience to an apostate. Once he's an apostate, 
You don't owe him any obedience. Now, he can call the canon law on you, and he can call the civil law on you if you want to, as Stanley's rights. But before God, in genuine Christian justice, he has no authority. Uh, he should have been deposed long ago, and the five or six or ten well-known apostate bishops we have in the United States, and the two or three that you're enjoying over in Canada, should already have been removed long ago by the people and by the church. They're not, but you have no obligation to obey them. A heretic, if he is really a heretic, really a heretic, um, then he's, he's, he's in mortal sin, and nobody should pay any attention to him. We should pray for him. That's all. The apostate bishop should be deposed. So we're in a situation there where the institutional church does not necessarily line up with the mystical body of Christ. No, it does not. It does not. And remember that at the time of the Arians, uh, as Newman pointed out in his, uh, in his examination of the Arian heresy, what restored the church, remember first of all, the Arian heresy was, had attracted 81% of the bishops. And St. Basil the, of, uh, of, of Nyssa, St. Basil the Great, uh, and Gregory of Nyssa said that when they went traveling and preaching that time, when they went into a church dominated by the Arians, they never mentioned Jesus, they never mentioned the Holy Ghost. They only spoke God the Father, because the Arians didn't believe in anything else. So they, they, they knew what it was like. And, but here, Newman points out that the person who, the people who saved the church, who finally got rid of the Arians, were not the clergy, not the Pope, the people. In their faith, the belly of the faith in the people, finally shed them shed them as alien material. It took three, three or four hundred years. Arians didn't die out from the church until about the beginning of the seventh century. They were as pernicious as that. Similarly here too, uh, it will be the people themselves, God in the people who reject them. But they, then they have to turn to the lawful authority of the church when there is a lawful authority that consents to exercise its responsibilities and tell the people the truth of revelation. Let's look very briefly now at Satan's assault on the very liturgy itself. That was a very successful assault. The objective was very simple. Satan's objectives are terribly simple, but they're always essential. I think we said before, the day that the Mass ceases to be said, that is the end, not only of the Church, but of the world. Why do I say that? Because the Mass is a reproduction, a reenactment, exact, and complete of, it is, of Calvary. It is Calvary itself in an unbloody manner. And that daily offering, as the prophet Malachi calls it, is the uh, pure offering from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, which staves off God's anger and wins all the grace for the world. If that ceased to be, and then it is the end of the church and the end of the world. There's no doubt about it. Christianity would go down and into that black hole would go the world with it. Because there's no longer any grace and rather than any sacrifice, it's all over. It's all over. And I think hell must be that terrible absence of all grace. Uh, even in the concentration camps of World War II, they were able to have superstitious mass, uh, surreptitious masses, and uh, secret uh, in the bunkhouse offerings of that sacrifice. This time there would be none if it were to die out. Now, the, I am always amazed at the horror the hatred for the Mass, especially in many of our bishops and priests. I'm a priest. If tomorrow I went down to the local church, St. Vincent Ferrer's, at 66th and Lexington, I wore Bermuda shorts, and I wore a rugby shirt on, and I had a yellow cap, and a, a two cockatoos on my shoulder, and proceeded to say a new innovative Mass, uh, that they would, they would be amazed at my creativity. If I went down in square Roman vestments, and started off saying, in three word altari day, they would call the police. That's the difference. There is a hatred of the mass. Bishop Keith Simons of Florida has contemptuously spoken, contemptuously spoken about the slaughterhouse priests, which is the biggest slur possible on the bloody sacrifice of Christ, because they're slaughterers, he says. And he, another bishop has spoken about those priests that have their face to the wall and talk to themselves talking about the old mass, with the altar oriented to God, with the people behind them oriented to God too. Their contempt for the mass and their hatred, their effort to stop the mass being said, even when the Pope appealed to them twice in this decade alone, give the people that mass they want. They won't. Many of them, and many of them do grudgingly and hoping that it will die out and they try and adulterate it with other ceremonies. That was 
that's that's the pity of it all. The 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 plot, the way of doing that was through a man called Bonini, Annibale Bonini, a Monsignor, now dead and gone to God and judged. I'm sure Annibale has seen the light. Where he ended up, God only knows. May God have mercy in his soul because he was a very evil man, a very evil man, who quite honestly said, I want to make the Mass such that any Protestant, any Jew, any human being can uh, partake in it and feel at home. How about that for the exclusivist church? How about that for the church outside of which there is no, there is no, outside of which there is no salvation? And he did succeed. He produced a Mass, as you know, which was so bad, so heretical, and promulgated by Paul VI, the two cardinals went to Paul VI and said, promulgate that and we'll declare you heretic. He withdrew it. It wasn't a mass at all, it was a bastardized form. With no sacrifice, no priest, no altar, no offertory. And then he produced a modified form of that, putting in words here and there, which Bonini put in for him, and created the present mishmash of a novus order that we have. Which normally is invalid. You've got to make an effort to make the Novus Ordo valid. You can make it valid, but you've got to make an effort. Of itself, it's going to be invalid. Um, and that he has imposed on the Universal Church. And I've been to hundreds of masses, I've been in my business, of Novus Ordos, just to notice the, the ritual. And the vast majority are invalid. And sometimes when you speak to the priest afterwards, you know, it's no wonder he doesn't believe there's a thing called the Sacrifice of Calvary. He doesn't believe in grace. He doesn't believe in hell. He doesn't believe in a savior. He believes in having a communal celebration where everybody loves each other and kisses each other at the, at the, when they shake hands. Uh, he doesn't believe in, in the mass as a salvific act of Christ on the altar with the people in veneration and adoring. Adoration. He doesn't believe in that any longer. Nor do the nuns, many of them. Many of them do. There are many good priests. There are many good nuns. But they're in a minority a vast minority, and the bishops who believe in it are in a vast minority. I think anybody who wants to find out how bad it can be should read the pastoral letter of Cardinal Archbishop Mahoney of Los Angeles on the Blessed Sacrament. I assure you that there isn't a guru in India, or a swami in India, who wouldn't be delighted with the letter, and could read it as a guru or a swami and be perfectly content, and never think of becoming a Catholic. From that it's quite obvious. Cardinal Mahoney does not believe in the real presence and does not believe in the real sacrifice of Calvary. Doesn't believe in it. If he does, he has so carefully hidden it that uh, he should be get a, get a prize. Now let's uh, summarize these series of interviews. We've taken a look at Satan's assault on individual souls, mm -hmm. on the world's political systems, and on the church itself. And it's a very scary picture. Mm -hmm. Is there any hope for us? And how is this all going to end up? There is hope. More than hope. We have surety. We are assured that everything is going to be optimum and better than it ever was before. But we also have the assurance that Christ had when he knew that he would rise again on the third day and ascend gloriously into heaven and reign forever. He knew, and we know, that in between us and that successful outcome of our present quandary and misery is going to be extremely painful. We know that from history, we know that from scripture, we know it from Fatima, we know it from what the present Pope is always saying and keeps on saying and even Cardinal Ratzinger keeps on saying. The worst is yet to come before it turns around. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. So we have no hope to avoid trouble. And that's why I'm always saying to my nieces and nephews, you don't know it but you've lived the best years of your American life. You don't know it. And some of them are not Catholic, some of them are. Um, now, that's for sure. So we're commenting on a very dire situation into which we have been plunged, not by God, but by the mistakes of men, the mistakes of popes, the mistakes of bishops, the mistakes of priests, the mistakes of nuns, and the mistakes of lay people. Everybody has had their, their share in it. But God's law is that he punishes the whole race for the sins of few as he did with Adam and Eve, as he does with the family who, where the father and mother are, are sinful, their children are immediately affected by it. So we're going to be affected by it. Thank you, Father Martin, for participating in these interviews. Uh, Bernard, it has been a pleasure and a blessing. God bless you and God bless our listeners.